Hey folks, thanks again for watching the Big Mountain Dub Club. If you have any comments, any suggestions, whatever, give it to us, okay? You can send them to Big Mountain Dub Club at gmail.com. Tell us who you are, tell us where you live, why you like the program or not. Send us a voice note, maybe, or a picture, a video. We want to know what you're all about, okay? Big Mountain Dub Club, thank you.
esta canción que se llama Llena mi vida Acaba de grabarlo con unos amigos de Monterrey Un grupo que se llama Bambú Pueden encontrar el video Big Mountain, Bambú Llena mi vida A veces es difícil ver Lo que nos lastima no se puede comprender Y en mi tristeza rezo una oración ¿Cómo podemos encontrar la solución? Los buenos tiempos regresarán no pierdo la esperanza y nunca dejo de recordar Nuestro amor necesita madurar Ven más cerca de mí, llena mi vida Ven más cerca de mí, llena mi vida Ven más cerca de mí, llena mi vida Ven más cerca de mí, llena mi vida. Yo siento muy seguro que nuestro amor ha de brillar. Los problemas que tuvimos los podemos arreglar. Ven más cerca de mí, mi amor. Tienes que ver que todo es posible. Si te atreves a creer, ven más cerca de mí, llena mi vida. 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 La vida es muy corta, en eso tenemos que pensar. En vez de pelear el sistema, hay que buscar la felicidad. Ven más cerca de mí, mi amor, tienes que ver. Que todo es posible si te atreves a creer. Ven más cerca de mí, llena mi vida. 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 Los buenos tiempos regresarán No pierdas la esperanza Los buenos tiempos regresarán No pierdas la esperanza All right, I want to welcome everybody to the Big Mountain Dub Club episode 7 Um, I want to start off by introducing and welcoming my dear sister, foundational bass player of Big Mountain, and uh, educator, music producer, Lynn Copeland. Thank you, Lynn. Oh, thank you. Good to see you. How are things going? You know, it, it's been a, a little intense uh, week for me. Uh, This uh, whole kombucha adventure continues to get more involved, and yeah. you know, I'm 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 having a little tough time with the whole being a business owner. I, I I just it just doesn't come natural to me, and I just uh, I just kind of put myself in robot mode and just keep cruising along. But it it it's, it it kind of brings on some very uncomfortable moments. Yeah, it is a lot of work. I mean, for me, like having to 
having had the music production company, I'm not active with it right now, but you know, you have to switch gears a lot, particularly when you're sole proprietor. And like in my case, even though I have a team of producers I work with, still I'm responsible for counting. I'm responsible for the technical aspects. So if a computer goes down or there's a technical issue, I get to play tech, you know, right. and along with doing writing and the engineering and, you know, you wear many hats and I always say I have multiple personalities because when I'm switching gears, sometimes I actually feel different and, you know, trying to create, trying to sit down and be creative when the academic me, I'm in the academic personality or I'm in the computer tech personality and I'm trying to play bass and, you know, um, I'm kind of psychotic, but I'm learning to accept that about myself. So, <laughs> how do you deal with, with relationships? You know, and, yeah, and, and trying to try to get things out of people, and and uh, when when you have to sort of bring up points about their performance that aren't totally favorable. Yeah, um, luckily, um, I don't deal with that too much i mean like within the group that i work with um we're good about just telling each other that's not it you know <laughs> or i'm not feeling it and we can accept that from each other um dealing with outside people bobby deals with that so we just have to keep him from hitting them um <laughs> other than that it's good <laughs> hey it's, it's like okay you can hit them verbally not physically you know <laughs> good old conflict resolution there yeah <laughs> oh man no well that's great i mean you know i mean it it, and it helps to have a rapport like that right i'm not feeling it yeah. and some catchphrases to be able to express yourself and and yeah you know and it's nice to be able, you know, when you're working with people that understand the jargon, so you can tell them, okay, you know, I'm not feeling it because you're playing it a little stiff. I need you to swing it more. Or you're playing it, you know, with straight 16ths. I need you to play it with dotted 16ths and have people understand what that means. You know, it just makes it a lot easier. How much do you think that communication thing falls into? the trouble that we're having in the country right now with communicating. Uh, how much is it a loss of jargon and or is it just people not trying to communicate with each other and trying to put up obstacles actual to real communication? Uh, it's, um, I don't think it's so much a loss of jargon as it is me mode i don't think i'm not sure the united states has ever not been in me mode you know like a lot of cultures are about we and it's like okay you know well i'm my brother's keeper so if i'm eating my brother's eating if i've got a roof my brother's got a roof we're more so a culture in the United States where we blame what we perceive as the victim. So if you're homeless, it's your fault. If you're on welfare, it's your fault. You know, we're not very empathetic, I'll put it that way, you know, because most of us are one paycheck away from homelessness. You know, you miss one bill you're out, you know, if you, for whatever reason, like the whole idea of us moving away from our current monetary system and going to digital wallets, you know, somebody sitting behind a computer, should we go to digital wallets, now has control over your finances. If they type in a digit wrong, you're supposed to get 4,000, they miss a zero, you get 400. Hmm. So now you can't pay your mortgage until you straighten out that zero that got missed. 
So you can't get this zero straightened out. Now your home's being foreclosed on. Now your car is being repossessed. Has nothing to do with you. It's just the zero didn't get typed into the computer. So, you know, now you're on the street through no fault of your own. But when people see you on the street, they don't look at that. They see you on the street. Oh, something's wrong with you. It's your fault. You're on the street. And that's, you know, how our culture is. So I don't think it's um, miscommunication. I think it's just the way we think. Lack of love. Lack of yeah. community. Mm -hmm. It's me and mine. As long as me and mine, or what I consider mine, are good, then you're on your own. And if you can't figure it out, then that's your problem. Um, I don't know if I told you I'm, I'm interviewing, um, or I, I already interviewed um, a young man from Indonesia, Ras Mohammed. I really enjoyed his interview. Do you remember going to Indonesia? We went to Jakarta, yeah. right? Uh-huh. And then Bali? We played in Bali, right? Oh, yeah. yeah well, yeah, I remember Bali. Reggae Sunsplash. Uh, yeah. James and Kevin getting Bali belly. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's funny the things you remember. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Well, the, the, the whole reggae scene in, in, in Indonesia is very thriving right now. And, it, and it's, it, they, the music um, has a lot of arrangement. It sort, of like sort of has like a, I mean, what you would think of British pop uh, reggae type of thing. There's like a certain structural arrangement thing that's going on over there that has a lot of pop elements uh, to it. Mm. Okay. And it's starting to evolve into more of kind of like what everything else is R&B, hip-hop sort of sounding. But uh, but it's taking a while to get there. And, and there's a lot there's a lot of um, a lot of artists in Indonesia that I'm interested in sort of helping expose the scene. I think it would be a good um, a good place to go right now. It's a huge Muslim nation, and I just kind of feel like. There's got to be something there that would uh, take us out of our comfort, our reggae comfort zone. So I'm starting off with Ras Muhammad. All right. Nice. Look yeah. forward to it. I'm not familiar with the reggae scene there, although I remember going, you know, I'm not familiar with the reggae music coming out of Indonesia. So that should be pretty cool. There's a lot of it. And then we got um, Rubio holding down uh, from uh, Southern Italy. He's been with us a couple of times uh, doing the, the dub plates. And then, of course, you and I just had a wonderful discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was very long. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but very worth it, you know. It's wonderful to have spaces to have those, you know, the type of discussions that we have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really enjoy it. And I think that it makes more sense every time. It's like I sometimes I think I can't believe I got all of these amazing people and they're going on with my <laughs> that we put up with you. <laughs> <laughs> you put up with me and my whatever you want to call this. I mean, I guess it's a, a video stream show, but in the end, I'm just trying to bring something different. And and you guys always. You guys always fulfill my expectations. No oh, good. We try. But, you know, it's just creatives, community of creatives, and you mix that in with the academic aspect. And usually you find, you know, creative people are academics because to maintain a creative personality, you've got to constantly be learning. You know, that's one of the... Uh, the curses of being creative. We have to have constant input so we can create. <laughs> Woman, you are so wise. <laughs> you are so wise. And that's the perfect segue to okay, uh, very good. 
move <laughs> into uh, to this interview because um, Ras Mohammed, he's written two books. Uh, he's recorded seven albums, and he has lots of very interesting uh, information and theories, you know, historical stuff, and then... He, he, he took a trip to Ethiopia and took a trip to Jamaica. So, And he's one of those, exactly, he's a, he's a perfect example of, of just one of those creative types that uh, refuses to create any boundaries around, you know, this information thing that we, that we get so absorbed in. Yeah. The lifelong learners. Yeah, because, you know... Well, you know, as creative folks, if we're not, if we're not getting fed, so to speak, if we're not feeding that creative aspect of ourselves, you know, we just kind of wither away. We just dwindle, you know, <laughs> we lose our purpose. <laughs> our life force. Yeah. <laughs> um, <you know. laughs> Well, this has been really fun. We we need to uh, pre-record this uh, show more often. Um, either that or, or wait for your next break. Take advantage of your next nine week break. Actually, um, tomorrow is the last day for a week. I have next week off, and then I go back on. Yay! So that means we can depend on you next week. <laughs> yep. Uh-huh. Yep. Thank you so much, my dear. You're well, welcome. We can actually even film ahead if you want. Let's do it. <laughs> let's do okay. it. We didn't do a bad job today. Yeah, cool. Okay, my dear. Well, uh, you have a wonderful week. And Big Mountain Dub Club, enjoy my interview with Ras Muhammad. It is my great honor to welcome to the Big Mountain Dub Club a man that has recorded seven albums starting out in 2005 with Declaration of Truths, 2018, Bambu Keras. Am I getting that right? And, uh, yeah, Bambu Keras. My Bambu Keras. <laughs> and uh, Indonesian reggae star um, and a man that is very, very busy, a uh, winner of several awards and uh, is... Spending a lot of time touring around the world. Let's hear it for Ras Muhammad. Thank you, my brethren, for being on the Big ah, thank Mountain Thank you, Dog Club. Big, Big Mountain Dog Club and the Big Up Kino. Yeah, man. <laughs> yes, and, uh, I. A great opportunity to be here. Such a pleasure. Yeah, man. <laughs> so it's morning. You live in Bali? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been living in Bali. I've been residing here for about the past five years. So it's my creative nest and it's also a place of rest where, you know, it can be, what is it, like anonymous, like, a, you know, an unknown person, just a normal human being. <laughs> they they, they leave uh, you. As soon as I step out, hmm? <laughs> yeah, they leave me alone. Okay. <laughs> they either like, are you famous? I would be like, no, nah, I just look like someone famous. I would just be telling people that, you know, because as soon as I step out of uh, this island, it's like my life is like a speeding bullet of touring and like that, you know. Excluding 2020, yeah. But other than that, yeah, really grateful and thankful to be in Bali, you know. What part They're of Indonesia? Really super easy live. Nice, man. I'm sure I, ba get... Bali's beautiful. I love Bali. Yeah. It's yeah, just, yeah. Super easy. It, it's amazing that all of that could be on one island. It's just like. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> it's so, so beautiful, man. And uh, anybody who hasn't, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, even even just looking at pictures of Bali, um, on the internet, even doing that uh, could could change your life in a positive way. Now, what part yeah, of Indonesia true. are your family roots from? Well, uh, I was born and raised in Jakarta, but uh, my family is from uh, Central Java, Samarang. So my mom is from Central Java, Samarang, and my dad, who passed away three years ago, he's from uh, would be considered as West Java. Nice. Yeah, it nice. would be called Banten, Rangkas So yeah. Do you From do Java a, boy? You do a lot of work on that island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Java, and Sumatra, all, all over, all over the place. A lot of the provinces, I'm um, quite active. You know, in Sumatra, in Kalimantan, and Sulawesi, and all that. Now, to all the people 
that don't know about Indonesian reggae. I yeah. tell them, you know, I, whenever people te- ask me, I said, man, you should, I mean, the, it, it's got its own scene. It's, it's flourishing. Um, I mm. mean, it's beautiful. There's so many great bands, so many great musicians. And um, um, give us a little taste of what would give us a sense of understanding how big reggae is in Indonesia. <sighs> reggae is big. <laughs> reggae is big time. Reg- uh, I mean, like, uh, it's, if it's either me or uh, Tony Q, Mastoni, or like Soldier or like Steven Jan, every time they play is in front of, I guess, 5,000 to 10,000 people. Wow. So it's that huge. And the, the great thing is that our climate all year long is warm, so we would have festivals are all year long, including from 2020. So yeah, that's how big it is. You know? It's just so people, people here, people here love the music, you know, but yeah. me uh, taking the role in the beginning of my career in Indonesia, I took the role as reggae ambassador. So I had the responsibility and also awareness and consciousness of like uh, educating the reggae audience and my own audience of where this music comes from, you know, telling them of like, you know, the history, the culture, and also, you know, who's, who's and who, who's who and all of that. Right. Oh, that's, that's great that you, you uh, accepted that, res- <clears throat> that responsibility. Now, how did that whole thing come about, the reggae ambassadorship? Uh, well, one thing, I'm a big fan of a third world. That's one thing. And I felt, I felt that, uh, you know, I think every artist, or every one that loves reggae music has the responsibility of like you know spreading this culture and also educating the people you know that is not just a musical genre but it's a culture of its own you know and uh, one of my big inspiration of uh, as a musician would be gentleman out of Germany you know mm. he never detached or disconnect himself from Kingston Jamaica mm. and he made a name of his own you know. He's well respected by, you know, Jamaicans, but he's well loved, also well beloved, also not just in Europe, but also in Africa. When I was in Ethiopia 2012, I was jamming with a few brethren, they're native Ethiopians, but they were playing Jenkaman tunes. And they were like, they remember every word of it. I'm like, oh, this is crazy. It's like, you know, reggae music cross over so many boundaries and so many like, you know, (laughs) nations and all of that is just Pure vibrations, yeah. It's vibes. It's beautiful when artists reach back um, like that, and I know Gentleman is famous for doing that. I, I ran into mm-hmm. my friend and mentor Marcia Griffiths a few years ago, and oh. and she was mm-hmm. on her way to do like a three week run with Gentleman, and she was tired, but she mm-hmm. was excited. You know, she was excited about being on yeah, the road yeah, yeah. Uh, with him, man. Mm-hmm. So that and that that's beautiful when when artists do that. You know what I mean? And and really respect. Uh, yeah, yeah. That uh, older generation of uh, of reggae musicians. Yes. yes. And uh, like with reggae music, it's something special. You know, I never, I never thought of like you know, having the call and taking the call of reggae music and still be here because of reggae music. You know, being in this seat in front of you, it is like <laughs> really mind-boggling and it's hard to process. <laughs> and we grew up with your music. You know, one of your first, one of my first exposure of like reggae music was with your work with Big Mountain, you know, seeing you on TV, on Indonesian television, and you're like, oh, what's this? This music is very, you know, it's very different, you know? And then, like, uh, I also, like, was called on stage by Jenkaman in 2018, and after that experience itself, like, I totally, like, cried tears of joy. It's like, this isn't really happening. It's like, you know, like, you know, I'm very thankful of the blessings that the divine has, like, provided for me in my life and my career, you know? Well, I, I, know, I know you deserve a lot of... Uh, of that, I mean, we could uh, we could give all the credit to the Most High, but you're yeah. very busy, man. You, I, I see that you uh, <laughs> you have a work ethic that uh, that uh, is is uh, very hard on, on on yourself. From what I see, because it just seems like between uh, the you. last you know five, six, seven years of your life, you've uh, mm-hmm. done a lot of collaborations. You've been touring in europe 
uh, and then doing mm-hmm. all of your work. I know that it, it's it's a lot of work. I know what being on the road is like. I, even if you're doing it in Indonesia, in a certain mm-hmm. geographical area, it doesn't matter. You're still very tired, man, uh, and it, it it's very mm-hmm. grueling, you know. Uh, wh- where do you mm-hmm. get that? Where do you get that? I mean, you're that driven part of you. That driven part of me, I, I, it's just passion and love, I guess. It's just passion and love, you know. But uh, to be honest, there was uh, some parts where I was, uh, uh, I think uh, I exhausted myself some years ago. And then I went to King's Nika and it really restored that fire. And also I linked up with a bridge in the mine. His name is Toki. So he's like my better half of my creativity. I found my younger self in him and just, he just sparked something in me where he gave me, besides Kingston, Jamaica, but also him, he gave me a rebirth on my creativity in my direction. You know, so, so, so I guess that I'm just enjoying all the journey. <laughs> and and I know every aspects and every part of the journey. Speaking and, of journeys, I mean, you you've uh, you you went to Ethiopia. Did I read that correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to Ethiopia. Yeah. That was, yeah. if I'm correct, 2012. Wow. Yeah, I was there for a month. And then 2013, I released a book called Negri Palangi. That means Rainbow Country is about my journey in Ethiopia. So it's pretty much like a journal and my meditation as a Rastaman, finding the connection between Jamaica, Ethiopia, and also Indonesia. You know, so I want to also, again, educate my audience and also the masses of like where this music come from because there's also the values in it there's also the culture in, you know, that's the that's issues. so great man that you do that um no, thank you man i mean i think um it takes courage uh, some you know mo- usually sometimes to impose yourself upon people right and say listen this is what i think and this is what i think that you should it's really important for you to know yeah um mm-hmm. Okay, tell us more about what you and I. I haven't read your book yet, Bridget, and, I, and I'd I'd love to. Mm-hmm. I don't do a lot of reading these days, and I used to be <laughs> such a prolific reader, man. Um, All right. mm-hmm. uh, and then, of course, I studied for a long time. But uh, but tell us a little bit more about that connection: Jamaica, Indonesia, Ethiopia. Well, there's well uh, one thing that's a fact of history ethiopia is the only non-colonized african country Mm -hmm. and one thing that is common that uh, for uh, jamaica and indonesia they were a colonized country but also coming back to the rastafari movement that is you know has embedded values in reggae music it's pretty much the search of identity one yes african identity and then for indonesia when we you know declared our independence we were searching for also our national identity that's one of the similarities that i found you know and yeah. in 1955 uh indonesia made the was the host for the first uh global conference of non-colonial countries or pretty much uh, the first global con- conference of colored peoples called the asia africa conference wow it was historic by then, it, it was a big threat to like the big colonial powers to the Western Bloc and to the Soviet Bloc. It's like, what is this? It's a small country who just like declared independence in ten years, just gather around all the other, you know, smaller countries to like gather around to like you know, fight the power, basically, you know. So it's like it's like for me that it has like the, that connection, Asia Africa uh, conference with like songs like uh, Bob Marley's Small Axe. If you are a big tree, we have a small axe. Yes. Know, like uniting, getting together, fighting the power and all that. So those values, I put them down in like the book, the Greek and all that, you know, the same spirit. And I was actually very blessed also when I released that uh, book in the Greek Lani, the Asia Africa Conference, the building itself now, it has become a museum. They invited me to speak about the, the book, and everything you know what it means you know the movement the asia africa movement and it was it was great like uh, performing my songs like uh one of the songs would be called emancipasi that means emancipation it's all it's all it's about asia africa but you know you have uh, so many like uh, asian flags and also african flags and one of the flags is the ethiopian flag the lion of judah flag you know in which it was the it, it was the old flag so it was like 
man, this is like a total divine connection. Something is like it's crazy, you know. <laughs> now I'm at a at, at, at a building in which, like, you know, like maybe 60, 70 years ago, was talking about you know the independence and liberation of all oppressed people. And now I'm singing like reggae songs in this building. So I'm just like, wow, it's like, uh, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear you speak like this, man. I mean, it, it's it's so refreshing uh, for yeah, for an old reggae man like me uh, to, to know that there's <laughs> you're young. Old, but, uh, <laughs> you're never old. Music keep us young. <laughs> Remember that? Music keep us young. <laughs> But you're, you're you're bringing up so many important points that I think a lot of people forget about reggae, right? And and it's like, mm -hmm. wow, man. And 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 I'm I kind of feel like I'm always the one that's harping. Remember this, remember that, you know. And I know yeah, yeah. we're having fun. We're on the beach, you know. We're mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this is this is party music. But um, let's not forget uh, what this music is all about. It's a serious music that deals with serious things sure. and colonialism. Sure. And like you say, Haile Selassie, Rastafari, big speech, United Nations told the whole mm -hmm. civilized, so-called civilized world, get the hell out of Africa, right? And mm -hmm. and we have to remember uh, those those values in reggae music because really, when it all mm -hmm. comes down to it, if this world wants to evolve and keep on moving forward together right mm -hmm. we have to let that we have to push that colonial past away oh, one yeah. and we have to be mm -hmm. critical of it right we have to we have to study it to understand how it's affected us and affected our our self-esteem and like you say our mm -hmm identity right our ability our ability mm -hmm. to say i am proud of who i am i'm proud of the color mm -hmm. of my skin um mm -hmm. and i'm proud of my ancestors that's reggae music mm -hmm. true true and i believe also with reggae music uh, it can be uh this sort let's say a weapon to like fight whatever remnants of colonialism there still remains you know yes, i mean I... indonesia is not you know it's not uh, Indonesia is not innocent from the remnants of colonialism. Like to be truth, to be truthful, and to be honest, we have a major issue in colorism. You know what I mean? Right. Like if you were to say, like if you watch TV or in the advertisements, like they would say, you know, have lighter skin color and all of that. I'm like, you know, we're not we're not the lightest. You know, we're not light skin colored people. We're brown, dark brown, and when you can say black. You know what I mean? And it's like, what's right. wrong with that? That's like the remnants of colorism. Just like maybe, I don't know what it is. Colonial like, uh, bullshit. Yeah, it's all this conditioning and all right. that, you know. And I feel that I'm, like we're working with a band, like my band in Jakarta, Easy Skanking. I was very blessed to work with you know, what a lot of people in the social structure would say, Melanesians, a darker, right. darker skin, skin colored people. Um, and I'm very blessed so I can break those stereotypes because in this like colorism issue, when you're the darker you are, in this world, they would view you as someone less, you know, right. with the social structure that we are, you know, that you're like, oh, you just, you just going to be a muscle for someone or whatever, whatever, whatever. It's like, no, 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 we can be creative, we can be doctors, we can be scientists, we can be president and so forth. You know what I mean? Mm. Breaking those stereotypes is very important. So true, bro. So true. And, and, and every word you're saying is, is so, so important for people to hear man and that's what the dub club is mm -hmm. all about man it's just trying to get some good conversations that we can archive and we can mm -hmm. just say Thank hey you. man this is how we felt uh during all these mm -hmm. times right now that we're fa facing some strange times i don't know if you got to see the presidential debate uh last night oh no i didn't see okay it. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's talking about just how this precedent was broken and you know, Donald Trump would not let Joe Biden talk. It was a pure chaos, right? Um, and I don't really want to get into that, but, um, you know, I think that there is sort of... Democracy has really shown its weakness in this time, in these periods, right? Because of... Mm -hmm. 
what you see is going on in the United States. You see that we, you know, even in, in a democracy, we can elect a crazy man, right? Um, yeah. And it can lead to authoritarian type government. And, and we know that, you know, United States, all of this idea that United States is free and the United States is the beacon of democracy. Reggae people know that's a bunch of bullshit. You know, we appreciate the United <laughs> States for what it is, right? But, mm -hmm. but the beautiful thing about reggae people is that we've kind of been conditioned. We've been giving, at least the ones that of, of us that really um, take this blessing, right? This, this Rastafarian mm -hmm. sort of uh, view of the world that allows us to break down all the lies and the illusions and say, no, this is really what's going mm -hmm. on, right? Um, mm -hmm. But what, what do, we, what do uh, young Indonesian people think uh, when they see sort of um, Western countries acting so crazy when, when Western countries are always pointing at Indonesia and countries in Asia and saying, oh, you guys, um, you know, you guys are you know, or, or I should say being critical of, of Asian mm -hmm, countries mm -hmm. when you see how dysfunctional democracy is in the United States? Uh, I think a lot of the young Indonesians would view it as confusing. Like, you know, they blame, blame a lot of things on us. <laughs> and they, there's like a double standard. Right. Like how America is, you know, it's like they, uh, let's say the state, or the government would like be be played as like moral police, like you know, pointing fingers. You should do this, this, and this, and that. Whereas in their own backyard, they can even you know take care in the matters of racism. You know, especially for this year for Black Lives Matter and all of that. And I was just like, you know, take care of your own backyard first. You know, we see how it is. It's like it's like yes. with the issues of like gun control and all of that. Like I think uh, America itself is like one of the highest. Uh, rates of like you know people dying because of guns you know and it's like it's by the ten of thousands per year and like that itself should be like a very scary statistics and like yo you got to check yourself you know people are dying because your inventions of your weapons it's like man you got to stop with the guns man like there's no one else Hello. dying there's, it's like it's like in indonesia there's no homicidal rate of like you know people dying from guns from firearms or anything like that you know you know there there is petty criminals yes of course you know, petty crime you know but other than that there's nothing like uh, like with firearms and all of that so it's like whoa you know <laughs> they get they get such a, a, a bad impression huh it, it's um and and that that ignorance of course is what we're suffering from right here in the United States mm -hmm. because people are are lacking so much of a really worldly education and understanding of the world right we're 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 in such a um bad situation bad time in the history actually it's always been bad but Americans right now are so close minded um mm. and it uh it, it it's really sad but that's not what this interview is about and <laughs> what, I, what I do want to talk about, um, you know, at one point in my life, um, and this was at Big Mountain's height, All right. and I'm getting personal right now, um, I was totally not prepared for the fame that I received, like we're talking in 1994, 1995, when Baby, Love, Baby I Love Your Way came out. And I wasn't really, really prepared to deal with the sort of the, the controversy that surrounded Baby I Love Your Way and reggae and Rastafarianism. And um, it really took me by surprise how how I wasn't able to control my image. You know what I mean? The record company mm -hmm. was, the record company set the image that they wanted to set. And I was, I was mm -hmm. always hoping that I was going to be able to fill in the holes just like you're doing. And I'm so proud of you for doing mm -hmm. that. Um, writing books. I should have wrote more books when we haven't got even gotten into that. And I had still haven't written one book, but uh, that would have been a good way for me to express myself personally. But I didn't, I didn't have the skills to do that. And I commend you for doing that. But 
you know, I I cut my locks in. I, Baby, I Love Your Way came out in 94, and I cut my locks in 1995. And okay. I was kind of going through this spiritual... Um, things were heavy back then, you know. It was going through this spiritual crisis, and and I... The, the only thing at that time that was really kind of holding me together was Islam. Oh, really? And a lot of people don't know this about me, right? But I, but if oh, you if you listen to my records, if you really get into my records, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you'll you, you'll see you'll kind of see. But a lot of it has to do with America's American Islamic imagery, right? Because my Islam was very much influenced by the Nation of Islam, Malcolm X, right. and Louis Farrakhan, mm -hmm. right? But then, of course, mm -hmm. that led me to read the autobiography of the Prophet Muhammad, which I've read probably 20 times since then, you know. Um, oh. And the one thing that really kept me from losing it was, and the only thing that would work, man, was praying for mercy from, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> just praying for mercy. Allah, just please get me through this time, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I can say these things now. Back then, it would have been, I would have been afraid to say that, right? Because mm. I was the most famous Rasta man in the world for a couple of years, kind of, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I had to carry that that banner and I had to do whatever I could. And I love Rastafari, I love reggae, I love Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's, it's. but this was my personal journey, right? I was going through this experience. Mm -hmm. I, could, I didn't have really anybody else that could help me. And I had lots of people reasoning with me but if you don't have mm -hmm. that conviction in your heart, right, mm -hmm. you can't fake it. And I wasn't going to fake it. Um, what, and we, we, there's a lot of Muslims in reggae. Jimmy Cliff and mm -hmm. guys like Alpha Blondie that have a lot of Arabic mm -hmm. stuff in there. Um, how is Islam and reggae, how do they, how do they come together and, and, and what do they mean? to each other. I come from an American Muslim perspective, you know, where it, mm -hmm. it was so wrapped mm -hmm. up with the black power movement. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was never um, intimidated by Muslims because Muslims were a part of our community. It was just so easy for me. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, Rastafari felt a lot more natural to me than, mm -hmm. or I should say Islam felt a lot more natural to me. Uh, than uh, Rastafarianism, and mm -hmm. how does it work? How does it work over there in, in in Indonesia, for or I should say personally for you? This is a personal kind of thing. You know? Well, personally for me, you know, when I uh, studied the Rastafari movement, one thing first and foremost about the Rastafari movement is all about Africa. Yeah, it's all about the upliftment of Africa, and there are so many Muslims in Africa. I think half of the continent itself, it's Muslims. You know? So uh, cannot just be a Judeo-Christian movement. It cannot just be partial, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you uplift Africa, you need to also uplift African Muslims. Because in fact, when we talk about Islamic history, Muslims in Africa have contributed so much to the world, to the globe itself. In fact, where I heard the word university it started from the moors you know people of morocco the That's muslims right. in morocco they shaped also the people of spain mm -hmm. teaching them about civilization and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and there's also uh king musa of uh, mali he is regarded as one of the richest men or the wealthiest man in the whole world and he's a muslim he's a he's a muslim king and he built empires in mali in which is stretched forth to east of africa you know, that needs to be spoken also. And, you know, we need to speak also about Egypt and so forth. But let's say going back to the time of uh, Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, peace be upon him, is that it's not known as in, in the mainstream of popular uh, history, but in actuality, the first exodus of Muslims, not to Medina, but is actually to Ethiopia because when that time during that time of persecutions against Muslims, <laughs> that's right. That uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, commanded his followers to seek refuge 
to Ethiopia at that time it was Habesha or Abyssinia. It was a king, a very just and wise king, and accepted Muslims at that time there. So when I see the I like the flag of Ethiopia or even the colors of you know reggae music, heights golden green, heights golden green, red golden green, I see the history of Islam also because Muslims were there. So That's when right. I go to Jamaica along alongside Rastas, I feel like you know I'm in like a time capsule you know, around Rastas in which I'm Muslim, but, you know, I'm, you know, I'm still around this kingdom, you know what I mean? Yes, sir. You know, and I feel like around that time with the Salamanic dynasty, there are also Muslims who are Rastas in the Ethiopian dynasty, you know, that because, you know, like uh, one of the greatest uh, quotes that I've ever read from uh, Haile Selassie, His Majesty said, uh, if you differentiate between Muslims and Christians in Ethiopia, you are an enemy of Ethiopia. Because right? mm. you really can't differentiate when you're in Ethiopia, you know. Rastafari. Because uh, Ethiopian Orthodox, you know, they, 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 they bow inside the churches. You really can't differentiate between Muslims and Christians in Ethiopia. <laughs> you know, so that, that, that's, that's one of the things. Oh, I that's beautiful, it, you know? man. That's beautiful. No, thank you, man. Yeah, man. You know, I mean, I, I in the United States, uh, it's it's just hurt me so much uh the anti-muslim and, and anti-islam sentiment that has yeah. that has been brought about and, and and that and that certain people feed upon right and they use mm-hmm. this sure. type of rhetoric to rile their base when mm-hmm. we know that this is just politics but people use oh, words in such horrible ways and and that's just not that's just not the love that's not the rasta love that uh that I learned mm-hmm. to back and I that I learned to promote and try to spread throughout the world um it, I only have beautiful things to say about Islam and all the muslims that that Thank I've you. ever met man I mean I um one of the things that was so striking for me was going into a a mosque for the first time mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. meeting people of so many different colors um, mm-hmm. and different walks of life mm-hmm. but inside the masjid there was so much respect and harmony and loving vibrations um, I'll never forget yeah, sure. that and it really I, I broke down and I cried because in the United States I had never seen that I grew up in a interracial family and although we all we all worked it out amongst each other i got to see mm-hmm. the back door right mm-hmm. i got to see as a little kid growing up what people say about each other and i've always considered that type of behavior so inferior to what humans should be like and mm-hmm. and that's why mm-hmm. i think i gravitated so strongly to rastafari because i, I saw it mm-hmm. as a bridge to be able to make connections and that's what I'm excited to hear you make so many connections and not and be courageous about that because let's Mm -hmm. let's be straight you you have to be brave to start reaching out to other areas and helping other people understand that Ras Mohammed thank you for your time this has been an amazing conversation I wish you success and strength and um and that you just continue with this clarity that you got, bro, because you. you're, you're doing good you. things, man. You're doing good things. And to all people that are checking out Big Mountain Dub Shop, don't forget to check out my new album, Satya. Okay, Ras Mohammed, we will uh, we will be linking up right. sooner, bro. All right. Love all right. and respect yeah. to all the massive over there. Right. Peace. Yeah. Okay, bro. Take care. Okay, bro. Stay blessed. All right, all right, everybody. Um, once again, I apologize. We had some technical difficulties uh, with the interview with Ras Muhammad, but um, we're going to be getting him back very soon uh, to the Big Mountain Dub Club. I still had some questions I wanted to ask him, um, and uh, I know that uh, he was also going to give us uh, an acoustic performance, but we were having way too many issues uh, with the Internet. And it just happens that way. You know, we just got to be flexible and move on. But so impressed with the young youth. So impressed with uh, Indonesian reggae in general. I mean, it's a very, very musical style. Um, 
of reggae music. Uh, and there's so much great reggae music happening in Indonesia. And we'll get more. We'll get more into that. We'll be interviewing more Indonesian uh, reggae artists in the future because I think I think uh, it's going to work good uh, on the Big Mountain Dub Club. It's one of those kind of emerging zones in the world uh, that means a lot on an economic level and not that that's really important to us but we know that when the influence economically of a country begins to grow then their cultural influence begins to grow um, and I think in this situation it's well deserved uh, Indonesia is a beautiful country with so much talent and I th I think that for the most part at least I know as an Americans uh, um, you know, Americans don't really have a realistic uh, view, or I should say, um, perception of what's going on there. And and uh, reggae music gives us an opportunity to do that, you know, learn about such an important country that happens to be the largest Muslim country in the world by far, uh, country of Indonesia. All right, let's move on to the, to the uh, Jamaican sound system. Um part of this show and it is my great pleasure to have back somebody that we have on the big mountain dub club quite often my bridge in the one man army from southern italy i'm talking about dj rubio my bridge and welcome back salute my family salute my family big mountain kino thank you every time it would be every time a pleasure you know oh man it's always a blessing to have the eye um, here, <laughs> how's everything going, man? Um, how's uh, how's everything in your town and your family? Everything is good right now, but you know, now the old world, the, the, some things are changed, you know. But uh, solid as a rock, right? Yeah, every time. It's everything so strange. Happens. It's so strange how the whole world is having to experience this at the same time yeah um it really yes. kind of brings the human race together in a way i wish we would understand how how intertwined all of our lives are we can't we, we can't even try to pull apart the human race is one whether we like it or not yes bro because uh, everything got change people moves different and our life is different in uh, 80 months eight months our life has changed but this is the life and we have to to be strong fight every day and uh, for sure the the things are come back at, at the, the the normality you know the standard right come back to regular our regular yeah. lives. You know, uh, today I want to change the game because um, usually you do some answer and question to to your guest. Right. But today, <laughs> today I want to ask you one thing because <laughs> yeah. I know these things. Okay. Okay, we're ready. So, when you when you catch the inspiration what is your um, uh, favorite artist or favorite uh, reggae group mm. that you are catching inspiration to grow up a big mountain Kino boy you know um, I think as a band big mountain are really received a lot of inspiration from bands like Third World, Aswad, and Steel Pulse, right? Awesome. Um, in terms of them teaching us how to arrange songs and bridges and uh, different interludes and, and live as well. But as a singer, um, you know, Bob Marley taught me how to sing revolutionary style music but when we signed with a major label that major label wanted me to sing more R&B and pop style yeah so okay, yeah, yeah. people that really helped me with that number one 
is Freddie McGregor. <laughs> wow. Uh, number two is Frankie Paul. And number okay. three um, is Dennis Brown. Those, okay. those three people really helped me find a commercial uh, version okay. of my voice. Okay, well, great. Awesome. Yeah, man. Thank you, bro. Wonderful. <laughs> what because, about you? you? Know, I, I want to know every time uh, some things about Big Mountain and the artists where I, I, I write message every day, you know? Yeah, I give and thanks, I, bro. Important for me. Now, what about you, mi brother? Um, Do you have a favorite classic Jamaican sound system? Sound system? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so in Jamaica, um, it, it's hard to choose only one sound system. There's so many but, good ones, yeah? Yeah, because um, Jamaicans are Stone Love, Kilimanjaro, the first Black Cat, and Black Scorpio. But I have to be honest with you, and uh, Jamaicans, one of these four Jamaican sound systems, are not my favorite because my favorite is mighty crown from japan wow yeah wow wow that's 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 uh that's some that's some very interesting information you're a brave man to say that <laughs> <laughs> david rodigan a little bit because you know david rodigan is um a conqueror uh, is a is a really important is not only a dj a selector right. a radio and so you know rodigan is a a foundation his foundation he's but a he's it, an archivist it, right he, yes so system is mighty crown mighty crown so that's great to know um now those of you who are listening and and watching right now um and are curious about the Jamaican sound system my brethren DJ Rubio just gave you some great information go check out Mighty Crown to really get a good understanding of uh, some of the cutting edge things that uh, DJs are doing great yeah. to know Mighty, uh, Mighty Crown was the first the first in a, the history a play hip hop in a sound clash wow Soon, Maria Maria was for the first time Mighty Crown a play. Wow. Then you. Play Akon, 50 Cent, Nas in a dog play style. It's impossible to have that dog play. So now you're talking then about I you're talking about the Santana? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Finish. Yeah, the product the GMB featuring Carlos Santana. Maria Maria. Yeah. The first song in the world I get adopted. Maria, and, Maria. Uh, <laughs> and them are the first I play Jimmy Cliff. Oh man. Dot wow. plate. Wow. Dot plate. Wow. So they started to reach out. They started to innovate. Take it to a new level. Yeah. Irie man. Well, it's good to know me, Breda. Uh, some of your influences because right here we love. El Principe from Southern <laughs> Italy. Very happy to call you my brother, man, and looking so forward to this performance, my bro. On the Big Mountain Dub Club, once again, the one man army from Southern Italy, my brethren. I know you love them. Let's hear it. DJ Rubio. Thank you, guys. Because before we start the DJ set with spinning the plates, Today, I have a surprise for you, Kino. Enjoy with me. Oh, yeah, man. Ready. Taking over the Washington scene. They say we're in for some country change. Big mountain. Right wing has only rage. But I know there's a secret path between Republicans and Democrats. 
I can see the dairy. The tune is called Bobbin and Waving. In this latest conservative. Go on, you two. <laughs> Where did you find that, man? <laughs>
give you real the trophy. Playing good music for me. No more see you should open your eyes and see. Better sing a shout. Move your sound praises forever. So the world can see. All the champion sound should be. I saw it, yes, I saw it. The music just can't live without you. In a Washington again. No way. Ruby, a place for number one sound. Sound boy should know it by now. The many sounds worth life challenge Ruby of the champions. Oh, let that sound guy try. Oh, your sound boy's bound to die. And there will be no cause or reason for myself to doubt this. Rudra's music is so real. I'm sorry, can't take a sign to see. Gino, the next one is straight, straight, straight for you. So we do it, ragamuffin style. Hey. Hold oh, on, man. But Rudra ragamuffin. Ready, McGregor.
I have to play the last tune for today. The tune is a real important cause. The original tune is sung by Bill Whiters. And my doublet is... From Toronto, from Italy. This is Kenny. fire, fire, fire! With the black people! <laughs> There ain't no sunlight in the sun. It just looks like I'm around every time you play. Stop, guys. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bo, 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 bo. Wicked boss, you wicked. You know the time is a little, 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 but it's a real, real funny for me. Oh, my brother, you're a real star, man. Rubio, you're a star. I'm not a star. You're you a star. <laughs> you, have, you have such beautiful energy, man. You have some fire right here, and I know... I know you come straight from the heart. I know you come straight for the people, man. And that's what I love yeah. so much about you. But you, you, you have a way. You have a way to present your dub plates, my brother, in in first class style. We really appreciate you every time here, man. I work on it every day. It's expensive, I, difficult things, but beautiful. You keep building strong, my brother. You keep building strong. You always know you have a home right here. All right? All right, my brother. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Love, bro. If you would like to contribute to the Big Mountain Dub Club, we have opened a Big Mountain Dub Club Patreon account just for that. Allows you to contribute using a credit card or a debit card. We will have different tiers in the future giving away different uh, items like t-shirts or maybe a inside view some old archival video of big mountain demos things like that we're gonna find a way to uh, allow you to choose from a, a number of different tiers okay thank you for your contribution uh, to contribute go to patreon.com that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash big mountain dub club Thank you for your support.
otra Como esta Intifada Guadalupana La pregunta La respuesta No puedo ser como tú Hay que ser distinto No puedo ser como tú No, no Hay que ser distinto eh, Cada vez Que cae el sol Siempre pensando en la Virgen Me voy marchando Y con mucha confianza Sigo luchando eh. Intifada Guadalupana No hay otra Como esta bandera no yo represento el sol eh, por una bandera no gracias no yo represento el sol La sacudida Es la hora de despertar A la vida Nunca tengan miedo Mi pueblo Porque siempre voy a estar contigo Mis hijos Ay, ay, ay Intifada Guadalupana pertenece a nadie, es la madre de la raza humana entera, ella da y nosotros recibimos, es un balance que no se puede negar, déjenme clarificar lo que les digo, nuestra tierra madre no se puede conquistar.
Okay. Well, we have uh, reached the uh, my favorite part of uh, the Big Mountain Dub Club, and uh, I love them all, but the discussions are always so informative, and we have, for the first time, we have five people involved in this discussion, so it continues to get better and more complex, and uh, let me just introduce uh, my brethren, Dr. John Marquez, and uh, my brother, if you could take it over, thank you very much, always nice to have you. Uh, running the discussion, and uh, you do it so well. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Kino. Welcome, everybody, once again to the next episode of the Big Mountain Dub Club. We're excited about the audience and the community that we're, we're building through this show. Uh, we're thankful for all of your patience. We're thankful for all of your contributions and your suggestions, and we're hoping to bring that all into the fold as we proceed forward. Here we are at the round table once again, the reasoning session. Um, we're joined by our gracious co-hosts, Big, uh, Big Mountain Foundational members, uh, Kino, our honorable leader, the one that's put the show together, lead singer and vocalist of Big Mountain, Lynn Copeland, foundational bass player, educator, uh, um, a member of the Big Mountain family. We're so honored to have you in our presence today. Paul Kastik, Big Mountain drummer, uh, worldly thinker, cosmopolitan fellow, fashionable icon, um, <laughs> is in the house today. Dr. Adriana Garriga Lopez is with us once again, joining us from Michigan, anthropologist extraordinaire, scholar, political activist, performance artist, uh, we're once again graced with her presence. Once again, my name is John Marquez, um, and I'll be moderating this last uh, segment of the show for us today. So we're in a moment of what feels like unprecedented political tension. Here in the U.S., much of this is tied to a presidential election. Just here in the U.S. alone, over 200,000 people have died as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've witnessed political violence in our cities as the result of black and brown life being destroyed with routine and relative impunity. We witnessed the people of Puerto Rico suffer from structural disregard in the wake of an environmental catastrophe. We're witnessing a rise in white nationalist violence as self-purported patriots have traveled to places like Charleston, South Carolina, or El Paso, Texas to commit massacres that they claim were inspired by slogans such as Make America Great Again. We've witnessed others travel to places like Kenosha, Wisconsin, feeling that it is their patriotic duty to help suppress a black social movement, committing murders on behalf of what they feel is a political slogan of making America great again. Within the past few days, we've had more and more chatter on social media about a looming race war tied to the US presidential election. Now this moment thus feels quite volatile Democracy seems unstable, and it seems at risk more than ever before in the U.S. and perhaps even beyond our borders. What is there to trust in, and what should we have faith? Or how did we get here? Or more importantly, the question that I have on my mind is, how unique really is this moment? Well, I think much of that depends upon who you ask, and we'll be asking our roundtablers today to contribute to this part of the questioning. But I can't help but to ask, when has there been a moment in the United States, in the history of the United States, at least if not the Americas, when black and brown people have not felt vulnerable and on guard? That is, when they have not felt prepared to flee or defend themselves from a nationalism that imperils rather than protects their lives? When, for example, have Native Americans, such as my own Apache or Pueblo ancestors, when have they not been on standby? And in, and in anticipation of when settlers aim to make their America great again, when have they not been on standby knowing full well that those types of campaigns always bring destruction and misery to our people? When has black love not been about survival and forged via an understanding of to whom one shall be able to run to when hell arrives at your front door? or at your community. Black love, similar to brown love, is forged in part by trauma, 
a trauma that's intergenerational, a trauma and awareness of a need to know who, when shit hits the fan, who will hold me down, who has my back. That, in a large part, is the essence of white, what we might call a black love or a brown love. It's a survivalist love. It's a love that's always on standby. Any critical thinker or knower of US history or of the history of the Americas in particular knows quite well that white nationalist violence is no, is no aberration, really. There's a dialectical relationship between the proud boys and rude boys. Black or brown people encountered modern nation states through or because of white nationalist violence. Blackness is a term in a category produced or structured through the violence of slavery. Brownness is a term in category produced or structured through the violence of conquest and imperialism. If we pay a critical attention to the origins of those terms or categories, we're often pro provoked to consider that maybe they were never produced to be in a safe space, never produced to account for the kinds of lives that elections or changes in political regimes can provide a safe refuge for. Maybe that's why we sing so much of love and of hope and of aspiration in our cultures and in our music. Maybe that's why we always imagine a space of emotional security that our lived world cannot provide for us. We live thus in allegories. We live in metaphors. We live in dreams of other worlds outside of the one that harms us mm. and that is proven to harm us time and time again generation after generation again, decade after decade again, century after century again. Now, perhaps this is what Kino meant when he coined the lyrics to the Big Mountain song titled, Bobbin and Weaving. Maybe he was referring to elections and formal politics, as he states, are the same old game, or as he says, they're the same old game of lies and deceiving. As he warns us in that song, don't you trust in no political scheme? When we dig deep and we begin to understand the true origins of nation states like the US, its colonies like Puerto Rico, or perhaps even other nearby nations like Jamaica, then perhaps that knowledge invites us to envision terms such as police brutality as misnomers, as inaccurate. When we saw what happened to George Floyd, when we saw similarly what happened to Luis Torres in Baytown, Texas, my hometown, what we saw happen to Rodney King in Los Angeles in 92, what we saw happen to Anastasio Rojas in San Isidro there at the San Diego border, and countless other cases, there's too many of them to name. These were all cases of the police functioning essentially as they were designed to do. These are not cases of extra force or of brutality, but they're representations or manifestations of mere policing. It's policing acting as police is designed to act. To this end, is this a pattern of state-sanctioned murder and resultant protests that elections can suspend or interrupt? Or without other options, do we invest hope in elections to be able to do so while ignoring precisely how and why? People such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, riots are the voice of the unheard. Or do we do so by ignoring how and what we've been protesting and rioting against and how we've been doing so, protesting and rioting against police terrorists since at least 1917 and nothing, that is no elections, no shifts have been able to interrupt any of that. We're murdered, we protest. We murdered, we're protest. <clears throat> and so we stand by and so we continue to stand by is a, as the anarchists say, is a change of rulers the mere joy of fools? Is a change of rulers the mere joy of fools? And so I repeat, we stand by and we wait, but we also hope. It's not the essence of being black or brown defined by how we stand by and by how we wait. We wait for the next Floyd. We wait for the next moment knowing quite well that the system is designed to produce an outcome that harms and traumatizes. But still, we seem to face no other option other than to hope that this time it will be different, that the next leader and the next chief can or will be able to provide us refuge. If the blues is the foundation of black music, then it represents the essence of those who have been forced to stand by and anticipate the worst. 
The blues is not the sound of us mourning what happened to us in the past. It is the sound of a people who anticipate what will happen to us in the future. That is, if the status quo is not interrupted. Like my co-panelists today, I think I owe it to my ancestors and I owe it to my children and their children to be skeptical about formal politics, to be skeptical about elections. I owe it to all of them to continue to stand by and to teach them how to stand by as well. Where do we stand in relationship to elections as artists, singers, teachers, and scholars? Where is our work most useful in encouraging a certain form of political behavior? Do we advocate for candidates through our art or through our teaching? Or is our work to illuminate possibilities outside of the protocols of the routine or the pattern of the again and again and again that formal politics repeats for us? Do we encourage our people to hope in being governed in a safer, more stable way? Or do we question the genealogies of governance as we know it? Do we, moreover, encourage our people to think or perhaps act in ungovernable ways as persons capable or willing to get free on their own or on their own terms? So to this end, and with that, I want to turn it over to my dear colleagues, to our round table. Hopefully, there's enough food on the table for us to, enough, us to sift through and think about the tension of the moment, the turmoil of the moment, but also our responsibility as people who are on a show, as people that people all over the world tune into to look for, for reasoning, to look for, for direction in our classrooms, in our art, in our music, in our families. How do we respond to the moment? Well, let me, um, let me open up and say a couple words, only because you referred to that song, Bobbin and Weaving, and Lynn and I have direct context to that song, and I guess we wrote that song together with our bandmates in about 1995. Um, and I think that the song and the message is pretty evident that that we had pretty much given up on American democracy as being a solution um, or, or a, a solution to, to really um, better our lives or change our lives um, or anything that we kind of felt that we could depend on. Um, and now we find ourselves, you know, almost 20 years later, wrestling yes. with this, with this question about democracy and whether it is functioning the way it should be functioning or, and now it's a nationwide um, phenomenon that everybody's puzzled by. And I don't think a lot of people in our generation, um, and I'm talking about the generation that, that, that our panelists are in, I think everybody's relatively realistic in our generation about the problems that American democracy is facing. And, you know, the, the, the toughest thing for some reason I have doing is leveling with my my mother and, and my elders, you know, and just because they still have this tremendous amount of hope, you know, they come from a generation where um, there was this conditioning in obviously in their education and, and it's a generational thing. Um, a lot of my experience comes from the immigrant experience, right? And, and, I think that there was so much conditioning going on like in the years of the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s that a lot of immigrant um, populations are, aren't willing to let go of. But as far as, um, as far as what we were writing about 20 years ago, me and Lynn and the rest of Big Mountain, I think we had pretty much uh, understood that uh, that voting is not going to, is not going to do it. It's going to take, it's going to take us really thinking 
uh, outside of the box, trying to find ways to organize that is not con- connected to government and is not connected to the change of government and and is it what is something that survives past the change of any government i'm tired of this depending on government to formulate our platform um and i've pretty much just given up on that and we can expect to see any change in government until we see a change in the consciousness of the community overall. I mean, the way you affect social change is, or one of the ways is the change in the, the philosophy of the people. So you have to get just the fundamental thought patterns of the people to change. Once you get that happening, then you get the people voting differently. So your vote does count, it does make a difference, but if people are still stuck in the same way of thinking, they're still gonna keep putting the same people in office. So you've got to get them to just perceive life differently, to have Um, a different way of looking at things before they're going to be open to voting for anyone different. And artists have always been at the forefront of that, whether you are a writer or a musician or whether um, you're a videographer or a painter or a dancer, um, artists have always been able to communicate to people that might not otherwise sit down and communicate with each other. Art has always been a way to reach across those borderlines, so to speak, and reach a number of people. So art has always been a way to communicate with people and to affect the way they think. Sometimes art is used to subliminally get messages to people. But, you know, really all you want people to do is think. You don't wanna tell them how to think, you just want them to think. And hopefully by stimulating that in them, you'll get them to constantly be re-examining what they think about certain things, get them to constantly be taking in new information so they can re-examine their thought processes and what's going on around them. And by getting them to do that, then you get them to go reflect that in their voting. That's my take. (laughs) Yeah, I I appreciate that. And and I I agree that the role of artists in in that process of changing people's way of thinking about the world is really important. And, uh, you know, visual art, theater, music, all the varieties of art can reach people in places where that can happen, you know, where the the transformation can take place, but it's not necessarily a fast process either. So that kind of sense of of standing by or or waiting or, or having patience for the long historical process, no, it's part of the experience too, which can be frustrating. Um, you know, I, I'm, as you know, I'm from Puerto Rico and um, the, the, the electoral system in Puerto Rico is um, technically under federal law, but Puerto Ricans don't vote for president. So that's one of the ways in which Puerto Ricans who are U.S. citizens are second class citizens. The people who live in Puerto Rico don't have a presidential vote. So even though there's primaries and even though they do fundraising and they sometimes visit Puerto Rico, when the November election rolls around, there's no, like, you'll see there's no votes coming in from Puerto Rico, right? So I think there's a different awareness there because of, you know, the colonial situation that the electoral system is pretty much, you know, a farce or bankrupt at the least. and I think, you know, I, I grew up sort of with, with, with people talking about how, um, 
you know, voting was pretty much pointless uh, under the system of governance that is, exists in Puerto Rico and talking about not voting as the form of resistance. Um, and there's a lot of people in Puerto Rico who don't vote on, on, um, on principle, right? Like you, you're being given options that are not real options also um, because of the sort of the battle for uh, what's called status in Puerto Rico, which is either statehood in the United States independence as a republic or some other kind of intermediate intermediate status. So um, so it's a pretty complicated picture, but a few years ago, I wanted to tell you a few years ago, there was somebody who ran a campaign who was like, um, like a guy, like an actual guy's body with a big puppet head. And uh, it's a play on words, but the name was Ninguno Gobernador. So nobody for governor, and the guy's name was nobody. So that it was obviously an artist, you know, uh, an artist kind of prank slash artwork a performance, right? And it went on for months. I mean, the guy was campaigning, and so it was like vote for nobody, you know, until you, at the same time as you were getting all these uh, electoral messages, you know, and, and advertisements, you were also getting this this artist's message to to vote for nobody, and nobody had your best. Uh, you know, your well-being in mind and nobody was going to help you get to where you were going to get to or you wanted to get to, right? So using all this play on words to kind of draw out the absurdity of the kinds of um, promises that um, politicians make, especially to marginalized communities. Because in Puerto Rico, they come through to the, pro to the public housing projects on an election year and they promise and they give gifts and they, they do all kinds of um, lying to the people, and then that's part of how people end up voting for the same old parties that have, you know, betrayed them and and abused their trust for so many years. So, you know, it's the they also like intentionally try to mislead people um, into voting for them and uh, take advantage of people's hope, precisely, right? So uh, it's that kind of balance of sort of, but at the same time as Lynn was just saying, like voting matters and who's, who's in, I mean, as we've seen here in the United States for the last four years, it matters who's in the presidency, you know, or in any other position of power. So it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely a, an interesting balance to try to think about that kind of both and, right? So like we, we, we have to deal with the reality of this of this system and, and also understand that it's a very small part of what we really mean by justice or what we really mean by equality or freedom or love, you know, as John was talking about, like it, the electoral system cannot contain all of that. It's a mechanism that is very limited. And the great uh, nationalist leader in Puerto Rico, Pedro Alviso Campos, uh, who led many uh, strikes and, and rebellions in the 20th century in Puerto Rico called the ballot box the um, the coffin of the nation. He said, it, 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 yeah, he called it the coffin of the nation. So those are my those are my thoughts for now. Well, boy, this is a big <laughs> this is a big one. I mean, as a Jamaican. I've been so used to from from the first time I voted in Jamaica. I think I was um, 16 or 17. But I'm so used to Jamaica having the, the whole cloud of violence and political murders and the this and the that, making the front page in the US hearing people for coming to from coming to Jamaica because of our political system. And when I see a year 2020 that we had a election with no issue, no nothing, just smooth. And then I'm looking at America. It seems like what was happening with us in the Caribbean for years as switch place and I'm watching what's going on in America and I like I mean, I was watching the debate the other night and I'm like, what the hell is this going on here? I was like, I was just shocked. Seriously, I'm like, is this really happening right now? Is this, I mean, you, the, I, I would say America was like, we always used to look and just be revel at the 
the system, how the transition was just decent. The debates were just until 2016. I, I just started being shocked as a, as a youth who pay attention a lot. But I just found out who the hell are the Proud Boys? I mean, I just found out that name yesterday. Like, what the hell? Who, who are those guys now? And that seems to be the, um, what do you call it? The new cycle now is these, I didn't even know there was a group of the political sphere called the Proud Boys. Who are those? And I'm on here in Jamaica and I'm like, our election just finished the other day. And before, you guys would have probably known that we had an election because it used to be so stink <laughs> over here in Jamaica. And now our election the other day, and it was smooth sailing, no issue, the transition of power, whatever, it was just cool. And then I'm watching now the shining beacon of light that's supposed to be America, so to speak. And I'm like, what? looking at the TV the other night, and I'm like, and I have friends calling me and, and saying that they don't even want to be, they, they're just saying, people saying to me that they, they don't even want to be Americans anymore. They, they were just so turned off by what they saw the other night. You see what I'm saying, John? I was just like watching and I'm like, what is this playing out here? Is this for real right now? And I don't know. I mean, as a Jamaican, it just make me, I, I mean, I have kids in the States and I'm like wondering really what, what's going to pop off on November 3rd? I'm just thinking that this, I've never seen a time where I'm here worried just about what may happen November 3rd leading up right after the week after. It just seems like shit is boiling up and about to just explode. That's all I can say. For real, I don't know. I feel that now. Yeah. It does look that way. I mean, a lot of us here feel that, you know, to me, that whole debate, I couldn't even watch the whole thing. It just looked scripted to me. I mean, it didn't look like there were two people that were actually running for office. It looked like two actors for whom someone had written a really bad script. And they were trying to pull off the lines. It was like they were in rehearsal. They hadn't rehearsed the script and they were just trying to wing it. It didn't appear to be a debate at all. They didn't discuss anything that was new. All of the talking points had, you know, been in the news um, forever. It was like they were just giving commentary on news articles they didn't really address anything. And I really didn't get anything from it. I was very disappointed in it. And personal attacks, I didn't expect anything different from him. That's what he's done. Um, I didn't think Biden really held up well at all. I didn't think either one of them did well, you know. But as um, Adriana said, the political arena is a very small aspect of life in general. So it's one thing, you know, to elect officials to try to help us, I guess, get through life. Because I really don't think the United States has ever had a democracy. A democracy being where the people elect the officials and the officials represent the people. I don't think there's ever been a time in our history where we actually had that. Um, so I can't really say we've ever been a democracy, but it's just, it really just comes down to the people and the individuals, how we interact with each other and how we live. Government, they're a small group of individuals that wield a lot of power but it's still our country. We still have the power. We just have to recognize that. You know, I, I, spending so much time in, sorry to cut you off, but spending so much time in Mexico, you know, what, what John was talking about before was just sort of this 
standby state that people of color have to be on just because we're always just going, okay, we recognize that we only have so much power. We only have so much influence. Our population is not big enough to really be able to change the full course of an election. And Mexico does the same thing, you know. Mexico just kind of waits around for what the gringos do, and then they have to react. It's always this sort of, all right, let's see what the reality is, and then let's decide what our reality is going to be based upon the usual uh, very unfortunate situation that we're stuck with and you know i uh as john was saying earlier this is survival this is this is something that's gone on forever in this continent uh, or you know this country that we call the united states it's, it's always been this standby and see what the gringos do and then we make our decisions based upon what happens i mean i mean Bear with me here. Isn't it um, like we have a saying in Jamaica, we say six of one, half dozen of the other. And that's what we, we really say about the two political parties here. But God forbid, whenever anybody else tries for a third political party in this country, the same people show no interest. Isn't that what's really going on? I mean, over the years, I mean, America has had the, the left, the right, and then you probably have some birth of some other party trying something or some independent. But what I've often hear my friends say, oh, they don't want that because they're just gonna take away votes from this guy. Right, right. Like I've heard that so many times, nobody has the patience to entertain the idea of a third party. That's what I've been hearing across the board, like friends in, Michigan, wherever they like. So everybody just sits and wallow in the mess of the left and the right. And isn't it really where we're kind of like the, dealing with the, there's the two evils there. Because as we're saying, you guys are saying that um, you have not never felt like you're living in a democracy. But yet the, the party that we're hope to, hoping to win is the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. But really, isn't it... It's a, it's, it's a it's a two-party dictatorship. Like, it's a two-party exactly. dictatorship. And that's just what that, it is and it, and, it, and but that, but it's but, just that one. but it's the form of government, Paul, that doesn't make it mm -hmm. possible for a third party. It, like if say for instance, you know, parliamentary system where you actually get the percentage of people in the governing body based upon the amount of votes you got in the election i mean i don't know if that would make a difference either because that's what england has right and we know that people of color get shut out there in england as well i mean i, I used to think that wow wouldn't it be nice if we had a parliamentary system because then at least we would you know people on the extreme left would be able to at least have some sort of uh, you know, what is it, a, 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 um, a, a chip to play in this and, and, and to be able to compromise, you know, some sort of uh, capital in a, in, a, in a compromise situation. But I, but that's that's not my expertise, so I, I'm just telling you what I know. I mean, it just seems to me, it just seems, I, I, I always start this, my sentences by saying, as a Jamaican over here, paying attention a lot to it, it just seems like, it's the lesser of two evils. It's just one of them is more brazen and outright crazy than the other. But really and truly, one of them was already in the system for the past 47 years. Yeah. Who is Biden I'm re referring to? And um, I don't really know much about him, but it just seems that it just seems like there's some dangling here, man. Yes, he won. He won the, the nomination. But we all know that. It's kind of like, you know, Bernie Sanders wouldn't ever get a chance or the other lady there. Um, what's her name? Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren. Warren and, you know, and those people really and truly 
and I hear them speak, I get a gut feeling deep inside my gut that they honestly, from what one and I hear them speak and their plan and the stuff they say, it does seem to be like they're truly in it to try and make some serious changes that will never be allowed. And I use the word allowed because it's just, you know, it doesn't seem like it's just not designed that way. You have to play the game right, according to Ziggy Marley and the Melody Makers, very first album. Play the game right. The and game it right. just seems to me like, like, you know what I've often said to my friends? That I could just, if we were living in mystical times, I could just go in the body of one of these politicians and I've watched enough politics on American TV to know all the answers what they talk about healthcare, to know all the answers what they say about social security, to know all the answers what they say about race. I've watched it so much that I've memorized I could go up on one of those debates and go toe to toe with any one of these guys because I've heard it all before the last 30 years. And it seems every four years I get ready and watch a show that I've seen before. Yeah, That's you know the script. That's how you I know feel. The, you know the script. <laughs> I think that the, I mean, we're, we're there's something a little different this time, though. I mean, I agree with you that that we've been here before many times, and that that there there isn't that much difference between the two parties. And yeah, it's true. I, I understand, but I do think that there is something qualitatively different when you have the sitting president of the United States like issuing a call to arms to white paramilitary neo-fascists. Yeah. That yeah. is, that, that's new. That's new. It's not that the white uh, supremacist neo, uh, neo-fascists weren't already there, right? They were there, but they weren't getting the, a call to arms directly. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Telling them stand by. They like feel that, threatened. They definitely feel more threatened now than before. But you know, but but we feel threatened too. You know, I, I right. live in Michigan, which is a swing state, and I've got to tell you, like, I don't know what's going to happen at the polls. Like, if I go vote in person, I would be afraid. I'm, I'd be a little afraid. Like, I don't know, if somebody's going to show up and do something crazy. Yeah. There, mm-hmm. there, that happens all the time. Right, you know, right, so. Right. Think that there is another layer of and violence that is there. It seems like it's designed to do that. Yeah. The very thing you're yes. saying, yes. Yes. it yes. seems like those words are purposely put out there. And I'm telling you, mm-hmm. I'm talking to friends every day that are literally just like scared and, and just like, and this is the feedback I'm getting from my friends in the States. Every day I talk to people and you're saying it now. And it seems like they say those things knowing that it will bring that fear and it'll probably have an effect on the the multitude of people that would have come out. Yeah, I think this is the first time in history, at least to my knowledge, that a U.S. president has threatened U.S. citizens. Because to me, that's what that was during yeah, the debate yeah. when he told the Proud Boys, you know, stand by as if I may need to call on you because even though I'm commander in chief right now and I have control over the US military, if I get uh, kicked out, I'm not elected, I will no longer have control over the US military. So I'm gonna need to call you, my militiamen, to come in and create this bloodbath, this race war that I need started, do you know? (laughs) Here in Kalamazoo, uh, a few weeks ago, we had the Proud Boys come through and do what what they do, which is basically intimidate, you know, stage a public demonstration and and intimidate people. And, um, you know, the cops didn't, they didn't even show up, you know, the cops showed up afterwards when the pro when the counter protesters were there. Yeah, Uh, that's who they arrested. They arrested the counter protesters, not the Proud Boys. You look at the pictures of these men. You know what? I was freaking out because I saw a picture in the New York Times of the, the, these one group of these Proud Boys, and there was a dude there with dreads. 
in the picture. He had dreads. And I'm looking at this man like, you don't make no sense, you know? <laughs> what? Yeah. So that's the scary, like it was one of the scary things is that this is like all these people around you and any and any of them could be in that mindset, you know? Oh that's, yeah. That's I mean I saw a black man online on Facebook today say that he didn't understand why people were upset that the president gave this shout out to the Proud Boys because he was a Proud Boy. I'm like, do they know you're a Proud Boy? <laughs> it's okay, John. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Proud Boys, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but you have those out there that are just so. Okay, now let me ask you this. Now, now those Trump supporters, and I, I know, I, I know, we maybe we didn't want to go down this this road, just because we're talking about Trump, just like he likes wants us to do. But now, depending on how what the percentage is of people in the United States, we're dealing with a percentage of people that are going to support Donald Trump no matter what. And I guess we'd say that this is like somewhere between 35 to, I guess it's somewhere in the 30% range. And these folks have dug in their hill, their heels. You know, it's sort of like, no, we will not let whatever movement people of color have kind of put together. And I kind of, that, that's what I was talking about when I was talking about this whole, they feel threatened. You know, the Obama presidency was kind of took the blame in the beginning for being sort of this happenstance that, uh, that took everything to a whole new level. Um, this is a phenomenon we're going to have to deal with in this country. 35% of the country in the United States is irrational, racist, uh, white folks full of scorn and hatred that are willing to support any populist wacko yeah, that, that took the chance to actually show his, show his true colors. And I'm sure he took that chance by getting advice. Somebody put that idea four years ago and said, listen, this is the direction we're going to go. And let's do this. Let's wake up the, the hidden. And that's what, what's going on. There were, there were obviously these set of people who were just keeping quiet, had their feelings, how they felt about immigrants and people of color whatever and just rode along and stayed quiet because they knew that it wasn't fashionable it wasn't the status quo to, to be showing your true colors and faith facebook and chatting that shit but when he came up 2016 and that first line i remember when he said past remark about immigrants being rapists and murderers that was the gaslight right there that started the whole everybody like oh shit really he's speaking my language and he said that and he said stuff like that and nobody didn't take him to task and he's not been taken down he's not been thrown out he's still going the distance in the race and that was the encouragement that was yeah. the i was watching the shit play it out and it's like people started to be like oh shit this guy and he's saying what i've always thought and that's what i saw happening on the outside looking in, I was like, look at this motherfucker saying all this shit and he's not being taken down by his party standing by him. They're standing by him all the way. And then people was like, oh shit. So people started coming out now, feel embracing, feel like, yo, shit, I'm saying what I'm saying up on Facebook now. These people that used to be quiet. And that's what that's what I'm seeing. That's what I'm interpreting. John. <laughs> John, your time. Too quiet, John. John is yeah, you're making us nervous now, man. 
<laughs> oh, because I know John didn't take this thing way serious, man, and rightfully so. I, I mean, well, I, I can't. one second, one second. I know I'm going off track here, but I, I don't know if I told you already, John, but the, you, we should really check out the commentary about the debate the other day and the whole system by Russell Brand. I kid you not. You're probably thinking, Russell Brand, listen, check that guy out and listen his commentary about what he had to say about the other night. The travesty that was. He has some interest. In, and let me tell you something. He didn't care. He wasn't only bashing, say, Donald Trump about what, what he did. But he was basically saying the same thing. Isn't it really six or one half does not the other? And one is really just more crazy fanatical, narcissist, and just like bow like that and self-centered. It's just that one is just more willing to really show his true colors. And yeah. I saw some interesting thing that Russell Brand said, and I'm just putting it out there. You should check him out and, and hear what he said. It's up on his Instagram. Seriously. John, again. <laughs> um Rikino and Lynn, I'm trying to I'm trying to keep the show a little a little briefer this time around. I don't want to go on for as long as we have been in the past, and we kind of streamline things, but I think there's a lot to unpack. I mean, a, a lot. And you know, Adriana will be familiar with this term, but I feel that you know, I work in the field of political theory, and one of the one of the phrases that came to mind in hearing the conversation in the response to my original provocation was a epistemological stranglehold. What that term refers to is that there's, that our ways of talking about politics, if not even thinking about politics, are incarcerated, they're confined, mm -hmm. they're limited, there's in a stranglehold. So as we talk, for example, and Lynn, I heard you, you mentioned this and Adriana and I believe Paul, and I believe, you know, Kino, the song Bobbin and, Bob and Weaving um, refers to the same old Bobbin and Weaving. So all of us refer to it's the same old game. It's the same old theater. It's the same old, same old. Yeah. That we see, that we see happening in the realm of formal politics. But I want to push us and ask the question of how much is our response to that also repetitious? How much is the way that we talk about that also stuff that our ancestors, or, you know, our previous generations have already talked about? Are we just complaining about the limits of a system and holding our nose? And this is not a judgment on anything that any of you said. I'm just trying to push the conversation in a different direction. Yeah. You know, how much, Good. how much do we succumb or foreclose to merely holding our nose and doing the best with the routine rather than push ourselves to imagine other possibilities, other possibilities with regards to how like one thing that's lingering for me, for example, for me, is what exactly is democracy? And what exactly is politics? Like we've said everything that we don't feel like it, that democracy is. You know, Paul has mentioned, you know, all my friends in the US say that they've never seen democracy or they've never experienced democracy. Lynn suggested that as well. I think Kino referred to it as well. So if we're saying that we understand this, the way that something is not something, do we have the wherewithal to define what it actually should be? What exactly is democracy? What are we asking for? And if we can answer that question, then I feel that that's part of the affect of colonialism to the extent that our very imagination mm. is also being confined and limited 
right? And that we're performing because we're on a show and because we're a round table, we know we have an audience that we're performing a conversation about politics, but we're really not even talking about politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel you. Right? I feel you. you. Oh, and just a couple ahead. of the questions I wrote down. You know, Adriana offered some useful language for thinking through this dilemma. Adriana said, it's frustrating, and, and you even stated, Adriana, I know it's frustrating to think that we have to, you know, the urgency of this election, it's frustrating to think that we have to kind of play by the rules of formal politics, but it's also necessary. And the question I had is, is there a, is there a threshold of frustration? Is there a threshold of frustration? If so, have we witnessed a threshold of frustration before? If not, what would a threshold of frustration be like, or look like, or sound like? So those are some of the questions I want to put on the table. Well, I, I mean, again, from a Jamaican looking on the outside, looking in and come into the States to work and, and cons constantly always going back and forth between Fox and CNN and the R RT, RT News, which is the Russian one station down there in Washington. I mean- You watching the RT News, boss? Yeah, man, of course. I watch all of them, know your enemies, whatever. I watch all of them. I watch all of them. but. I'm just saying, I've never, this movement that is going on, I mean, whosoever is behind it or whatever, I would say there's a certain example of the threshold seems something, maybe it's the George Floyd. And I mean, I mean, and I'm like wondering, but yeah, but even as blatant as the George Floyd death was, was the same blatantness of the guy Castile who literally got shot with his kid in the car and his woman oh, beside yeah. us. I'm just like, that was blatant. I mean, we saw it's footage of the guys. It's not just the things we've seen on, on video. What I, what I was trying to do, and Paul, I, I really do apologize for cutting you off, but just to better contextualize what I'm trying to say, and what I tried to, what I intended with the original provocation that I introduced this segment with is what is not so routine about that? How is, how is this not new? For example, Lynn, how is it, when we say it's unprecedented that a president incites this kind of white nationalist response, not only is, I think it it's, it's, it's deserves the question of, well, maybe there has been moments where that has happened before, but even deeper than that, maybe the United States of America and its purported investment in democracy in and of itself is a call to white nationalist violence. Yes. Yeah, I would agree with that. I wouldn't say that Trump is the first president that has incited white nationalism. My comment was more to, he's the first president to my knowledge that has called for violence against its own citizenry. So the difference being that you have had presidents that were white supremacists and they believed in the superiority of um, white people and that everyone else would be subjugated to white people and that America was a white country. But I am not aware of those presidents actually just coming forth and saying that we have to, as a white society or as white supremacists, take violent means to suppress everyone else. That may have been the subliminal message that they were giving but I don't remember historically a president just saying that as Trump did. Um, in answer to your statement about what we believe democracy is, to me, um, by definition, if democracy is, democracy is supposed to be, 
a form of government where the people or the populace elects its representatives and those representatives um, respect the wishes of the populace and they that way, then the people would feel in kind that that's what's going on. So I, that's what I would be looking for, to feel like the government is representing the wishes of the people. You're not going to make everyone happy ever, but if you can have the majority of the people happy, if you can have the majority of the people even feel like, okay, we have a good quality of life. There are things wrong. Yes, there are things that could be better, but overall it's a good quality of life. And then you also mentioned the level of frustration. Um, had we had a level of frustration like this before and when would the level of frustration be enough? I think we have had various levels of frustration like this before, but I think the levels of frustration always end up being individualized. They're not a group level of frustration. If you look at the artist community, you've had artists from Paul Robeson to Josephine Baker to, um, Oh man, what was her name? Billie Holiday. Like Paul Robeson, Billie Holiday got blacklisted for their activism. Um, Louis Armstrong was a community activist. He was activist. He was um, active in civil rights. He wasn't blacklisted, you know, so he wasn't forced to leave the country. Paul Robeson and Josephine Baker ended up leaving the country. Um, Billie Holiday was blacklisted and ultimately you could say that she was murdered because when she got ill and was hospitalized, she was handcuffed to her hospital bed by government order. She was denied medical care and by that denial, she died. So you could say that she was assassinated because of her political views and her activism. So the level of frustration did get to be too much for these individuals and by their actions, it caused them to be blacklisted and it caused them to basically be enemies of the government. And you see that with individuals. I don't think we've seen groups get to a level of frustration where they have been responding as a group. You have factions that do that. Like for instance, now you have the NFAC, um, the Not Fucking Around Coalition, which is made up um, of a lot of citizens, but you also have a lot of ex-military members that are part of that group. And they show up basically to defend black people and people of color at these various political gatherings and rallies where white supremacist groups are showing up. Um, mm -hmm. They have come out of a level of frustration, but for the most part, I don't think we're seeing groups get upset. Like for instance, in the 60s, the civil rights movement, you had a group of people of all colors and nationalities come together and fight for civil rights. We haven't had that on a mass scale happening now. Well, we've seen, we, we, see, we have seen some massive protests that that uh, I think there's a generational element that we're, we haven't really talked about um, because, you know, somebody mentioned, I think it was Paul that mentioned Bernie before and, and uh, you know, a year ago, things looked pretty different as far as like what we thought this election might be, uh, you know, all sort of like all of the, the, the critiques of the electoral process. And, and, and I think that the epistemological stranglehold includes the electoral process, right? That, that stranglehold that you were talking about, John. 
Uh, but even if you just look at the electoral process itself, like uh, Bernie seemed to be in the lead for the candidacy. Um, and it, when when black voters, I think it was in South Carolina, voted him, uh, gave him such a big lead that it sort of propelled him into the candidacy. Um, the, you know, people said it was black people, it was black voters that that propelled him, but in reality, it was older black voters, and the majority of the younger, um, the young black vote was actually for Bernie. So I do, I do think that there's there, there's also a, a generational element, and you know, in the in the middle of this pandemic, uh, the folks who were maybe least susceptible to the worst effects of COVID, which are the young folks, right? The, the teenagers and people in their 20s and early 30s, they were out in in massive numbers. And, you know, some places are still out on a nightly basis. Um, uh, you know, people of uh, a pretty broad mix of people are led by black, uh, by black activists, certainly, but, but it is a kind of coalitional demand um, for for respect for Black life, and, and I think more broadly than that, also for, for social justice. So, I mean, I do think that there's some encouragement there, and I have to give it up to um, Cornell West, who has been, you know, uh, he had a complex relationship with Obama, <laughs> but uh, he's been speaking some truth lately about uh, how we have to vote for Biden, but not lie to the people, and then sort of not try to pretend like Biden is really bringing anything other than not being Trump. Like that's all he is, is just not Trump. And that that's worth voting for at this particular point in time. It's worth voting for not Trump. And if we can get young folks to come out, it makes a difference. Yeah, so, so I do think that there's work to be done there that's significant in this particular moment in which we have genocide taking place in immigration camps where people are people are being you know having their uterus removed without their consent uh and and that you know the majority of the people in detention and immigration detention are actually black people and there's been reporting done about that it's so you know, people have an image of it being all mexicans or all central americans that certainly are central american mexican latin american brothers and sisters but the majority of people at this particular moment in time held in immigrant detention jails are black people because there's been so much deportation of uh, folks from Latin America that the folks, there's a lot of Haitians and a lot of African immigrants that are waiting in these deportations. So when we're talking about the genocide that's happening in, in the detention centers, we're, we are talking about anti-black violence. And so you know, I, I think when, when, when I start to think about it like that, when I start to think about it in this very concrete kind of materialist sense, John, I like, I'm like, you know, okay, I'll think about the epistemological stranglehold later, but I'm going to definitely, you know, vote <laughs> or tell my students to vote, which I've actually never done before. This is the first time in my life that I tell my mm. students to vote. I've never told them that before, but this time I said, you guys, we, we need the young people to come out and vote, you know? So I, I do think that at this point that feels really urgent and it's and then we can deal with Biden, who would be no good, like Cornell says, right? Let's not lie to ourselves. Let's not lie to the people. This guy is going to be our enemy too. We're going to have to keep fighting him too. But I, I mean, we're we're in a situation that I think is pretty acute right now in terms of uh, of the the violence that we're existing in. I think so, we we don't even realize what we're going through. And I, I, I'm constantly having this conversation with my partner. It's like, do you think that we're living on, in a dictatorship and we just haven't realized it? Is that what's happening? Are we living in a dictatorship? And there's this element of that I think we are, but we don't, we don't elaborate that. We don't elucidate it. We don't acknowledge that. But that's what's happening. And that's what's happening in Brazil. And that's what's happening in other places too, in, 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 in many other places. So I think you know, we have to confront the moment also beyond the United States and understand that there's a sort of global formation of authoritarianism and dictatorship and right-wing extremist ideologies that are, have taken hold. And I, I think we have to, at some point, look beyond the national borders uh, and start to you know, think about what resistance or what liberation means beyond the national, because it's, you know, for many reasons. I'm gonna stop there. But. Obviously, I'm on a I'm on a hot one, so I can keep going. But I, yeah. I feel like I'm talking for a while, so I'll stop there. I think that was very useful. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. Thank you, Athena. I think that um, 
I think these these types of spaces are are important for this kind of conversation in particular. Exchanges. I mean, we're all visionaries. We're all people who work in the imagination, and we're all people who try to disseminate our imagination as educators in one way or another, right? Um, you know, for me, the tension within this conversation that's driving our conversation is between the universal and the particular, essentially. Like, I think Adriana's correct that there's a particularity about the current moment that creates a different kind of urgent imperative that almost requires us to participate in formal politics, if not even at an unprecedented level. But I don't, but I think at the same time, we can't abandon the universal, which is, it places some of our statements into question, such as, are we living in a dictatorship? It's like, well, for, in certain perspectives, when has not the United States or the entire West not been a dictatorship? When has it not been genocidal? Like where, where has there, been a harmonious relationship specifically with the African diaspora, specifically with indigenous peoples? When has the West not been a cataclysmic failure in terms of living up to its promises? Like, uh, you know, even the, once again, we're, we're confined by even the terminology we use. The term black was produced through and because and to continue slavery. It can't be removed from the structure from which it originated brownness, indigeneity, and this is what I was trying to speak of earlier in terms of the, the universals, like, well, well, what are we in? Mm -hmm. What is this thing mm -hmm. called life? And what are these categories and what are these terms that we use to try to navigate and describe the ways that we feel that life? So I think it's important, and I think that's what Brother West is trying to accomplish by saying, yes, we have to participate, but at the same time, let's not, that be, let's not let that be our only level of political participation. And I would also push it a little further, and, and I've talked and I've talked to Dr. West about this personally, <laughs> but it's the let's not abandon altogether another articulation and imagination of politics, if not that allows us to abandon even the concept of politics itself. Why are we so Why are we so committed towards the concept of democracy without understanding fully what it is and what its origins are? What is the demos and what is what is kratis? What is in terms of you know Greek philosophy, what does that emerge from? What is, and this is going to go off on a deeper tangent, but what is an archangel other than somebody we anoint to speak, to be an intermediary that speaks between us and God, right? And there's part of Greek philosophy that refers to this notion that the term arch, arche, refers to an anointed person that speaks on behalf of us. And, de and demoskratis, the very idea of democracy, has always been rooted in this idea of the ark. The, somebody has to be elected and anointed to speak for you, right? So there's an archangel or the ark representative, a person that's elected. But if you think about the genealogy of those terms, you're also suggesting that the people truly don't have the capacity to decide for themselves. You're almost surrendering the fact that democracy even the name of democracy eliminates the, the possibility of democracy altogether if democracy is unfolding in an electoral system. Right. I mean, if you talk about radical democracy, that's a different thing. Yeah, that's different. And so <laughs> a radical commitment to equality is something that's anarchist because the term anarchy is anti archy that you don't need the intermediary. You don't need the hierarchy. You don't need the structure of government. In order, in order to accomplish the, the thing that we're referring to as democracy, which is rule of the people, by the people, for the people. What you need is a more radical definition of what the people are and who the people are and what their relationship to one another is. And so you have the anarchist tradition, anti archy We don't need the archangel. We're against the archangel. We don't need that. We can speak directly to God. We can speak directly to peace and harmony. And so the anarchist tradition in the U.S., you have you know, Emma Goldman and Lucia Gonzalez Parsons and others who are asking critical questions about voting early on. Right? Lucy, Lucy Gonzalez Parsons was asking the question of, uh, you know, what would she say? Never be deceived that the rich will allow you to vote away, their, vote away their wealth. Or Emma Goldman saying that if voting changed anything, they'd make it illegal. Right? 
And so what they're pushing for is, is a more radical contextualization of this thing that we refer to called democracy, which is like, we got to redefine our relationships to one another first and foremost, and be able to truly understand the genealogy of the categories that incarcerate, incarcerate us in original moments of violence, which are slavery, conquest, genocide, and then therefore have a more critical understanding of what precisely are we asking for when we ask for freedom? What are we asking for when we ask for justice? What are we asking for when we ask for equality? And when you say it like that, I, th I think in the Adriana, she uh, mentioned this earlier. I think that the youth today, they are re-examining their relationships to each other, maybe not based upon political sort of um, capital or political uh, uh, hierarchy, so to speak, but but at least on, in, 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 in sense of gender and race, mm -hmm. I think there is a shift uh, going on. And I, and I know that, um, you know, we can go back and forth about the state of, of this new generation, but, um, you know, the ability to think outside of the box and- Well, they're asking questions. They're asking questions about what, what exactly constitutes civil society. And as we push for inclusion into civil society and we campaign and we petition over and over and over again to ask for inclusion, please give me refuge within civil society. You reach a threshold of frustration to where you say, well, what the fuck is civil society anyway? Yeah, 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 yeah. And how do, how do you live in that? And who came up with that idea? Right. Like were these gender roles and like the family supposed to be a certain way and look a certain way and function in a certain yes. way and the economy is supposed to function in a certain way, we're supposed to eat certain foods? Like maybe the idea of civil society as we know it needs to be abandoned and unsettled. And I think that's that's the imperative of redefining what our relationships are. Absolutely. Them. Absolutely. Because, you know, this goes back to the whole idea of everybody in this panel right now, I know is, is lousy capitalists, right? I know nobody in this panel is going to be successful. <laughs> Why you got to call me out though, man? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, 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 but, but it, it goes far beyond our political beliefs, right? It goes, it goes to our, our upbringing, the community that yeah. we were raised in, right? We just don't have that greed gene or that greed upbringing. We, it, it's beyond us. So it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter how we study. It doesn't matter how we prepare ourselves. We are just not going to be successful in a capitalist society when, when you're talking about making money yeah. and doing all of those uh, cool, because shifty little yeah. things that capitalists do because they love money and because that's what they focus on. And we know we're always going to be on the bottom of the pedestal or on the bottom of the totem pole based upon just who we are. And we just out of the gate, we were losers. I think Adriana said it best last week. She says, you don't get free by yourself. You know, you don't get free alone as so an individual. True. So true. And, 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 and yeah, so and, and the more we were torn of, apart, yes. This thing you're speaking of, Kino, you know, capitalism depends upon conflict between individuals. It runs by a politics of meritocracy and competition and conflict in terms of your individual interests. But there's other traditions that are lingering within our psyche, within our culture, within our homes within our life practices that, that we're not imagining now think, never allow us to think of ourselves just as individuals and so then that therefore handicaps us in terms of our capacity to to participate in the free for all that is the capitalist market porque nosotros sabemos cómo machar right we know how to we know how, we know how to break shit up and share like you're not going to eat you're not going to eat a bunch of food in front of your people right no way that are hungry no way. You're gonna break it up. You're gonna para andar iguales, right? You're gonna everybody's gonna eat the same. And that comes from a tradition of survival. And if there is anything radical to our traditions that we can salvage, it's how we've survived survived this shit as long as we have. And we've survived in thinking about one another's interests and abandoning the concept of the human, abandoning the concept of the individual which is all Western thought. All Western thought is rooted in the individual. I think, therefore, I am. I'm an island. 
you know, I'm a rational being. I have individual meritocracy. I have sovereignty over my body. That, that philosophy conflicted with the rest of the world. And it actually was new. And we come from traditions and cultures that had thousands of years of a head start in terms of being more harmonious, being more peaceful, and being more sustainable. So that's what we're in. That's that epistemological stranglehold. You know, what, what does it take for us to, I think, recuperate the things that are already thriving within our cultures, but also put them in the forefront and allow us to question exactly what we're asking for from this society? While we, albeit frustratingly, Adriana and Lynn, still participate in formal politics because of the urgency of the moment. And now, and I'm sorry to, to uh, take over this part of the conversation, but we that do. also has something to do with our level of threshold, right? That you were talking about, that tolerance level. Just good people that just want to live their lives with their family. They just want, you know, I don't want a castle. I just want to live my life in peace. So our threshold and our tolerance, our threshold is lower and our tolerance level is manipulated by just that, that wanting of peace in, in your life that I see so many of our people of color you know, doing. It's just like the whole oh. Biden, the Biden thing, that was, you know, I mean, I, I almost kind of feel it like it was like African Americans not wanting to offend the Democratic Party, right? I mean, it's just love, right? It's just black people just feeling this, this, this connection and this, this uh, desire to not offend the Democratic Party by supporting somebody like like Bernie. That's how I took it. Mm. I think there's something to it. I mean, I think we're also defensively numb. I think we don't know how to feel. That, that's part of what a, I was talking about. In a powerful way. Yeah, that's part of what I was talking about, where I was like, when I was asking, like, are we in a, in a in a dictatorship? But we don't. We're not really kind of in tune fully uh, with what's going on, you know. Or maybe a lot of people are not really in tune with what's going on, and there is a lot of numbness. That's colonialism. I mean, Fanon said that, right, Adriana? That's you know Fanon's work. Franz Fanon was describing the kind of psychosocial effect of colonialism that it basically kills you from the inside because you have to become defensively numb, melancholic, perpetually melancholic in order to survive your day-to-day -day life. And so you forget how to feel. And this is why I think there's other, there's other strategies other than voting that we should not condemn and look down upon as being counterintuitive. And Absolutely. I think anger, and I didn't want to say this in this cast, but I'll go ahead and say it because we're alluding towards it. Mm -hmm. I don't think anger and violence are counterintuitive. I think that they're a, a tactic that gets us, that serves as a more rational political voice and political vehicle for the things that we actually want than anything else. Social protests are what galvanize change. And they happen when people are afraid of what people of color might do to this world. And we've seen it time and time again. I mean, I think that's why Dr. King said what he said. Protests work. It's sad that, that they do. It's sad that that's, our, that's a vehicle that's functional for us and that we have to turn to the streets in that way. Yeah, but well, the, history, well, the history speaks for itself. Hmm. If it wasn't for our willfulness to do that, there would, you know, slavery was abolished because of that. Hmm. Voting rights was established because of that. Desegregation happened because of that. Yeah. The curriculum in our schools changed because of the black power yeah. movement. And it's not, and it wasn't because of the vote. No. It was activism. It came from protest. Well, and for women, you know, the vote also came through protest. Yeah. yeah. So let's not forget that. Let's not just, at the same time, that's the more universal. That, that speaks to the quagmire that we're actually in. Is that, you know, those things happen for a reason. Now, I don't think 
we're necessarily promoting that type of behavior, promoting anything. We're just placing it in a context as intellectuals and artists. We're saying that's essentially the world that we live in. That's the truth. But you know, going going back to art, John, if I can um, Please. jump in. I, my, one of my mentors, uh, Edgar Rivera Colon, likes to say that the people need myths. They need a myth. And uh, you know, that you there's like only so much of that raw kind of desperate reality that one can really take, you know? Um, and that the, the creative imagination and the the, the the those other layers of the self um, that are more free, they need to grasp on to, to images or, or sounds or or other kinds of, you know, aesthetic experiences that come through myth making, which is what art is, right? Uh, so I think that there's, when you get to that level of sort of undoing that, that epistemological stranglehold, you, you, you need to be sort of willing to play in the, in the garden of myths as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. That's what Rastafarianism is. And now, well, I wouldn't necessarily ask what it is, but that's how it functions. There's a reason why people gravitate towards it. There's a reason why, and Paul, this is right up your alley. There's a reason why the Garvey movement was the most comprehensive, largest, arguably one of the most powerful black movements, self-determination, decolonial movements that we've witnessed because it created a mythology, a counter mythology, a counter mythology to the West. It flipped the script. Right. It basically said, no, we're rightful, we're rightful kings and queens of this planet. Until, until they, they found, found it a way to deport Marcus Garvey and stain his name and all that stuff. Sad. But that was his genius, right? Yeah. And I think Adriana's absolutely right. I mean, our myths have to function as realities. You know, Kino and I, maybe this is a good segue to concluding, but, you know, we, we had an interesting conversation decades ago. We were talking about how to suture together all of these different pieces of ourself, of who we were. Chicano nationalism, black nationalism, Marxism, indigeneity, like there's all these different kind of mythologies that informed how we thought about and saw the world. And sometimes they didn't, they didn't harmonize well with one another. And sometimes we felt lost and we didn't know how to put, piece them together. And I remember you, Kino, responding and you're just saying, you know, when the world is cold, whatever cloak is the closest to you that you reach for and you have to wrap yourself in, that's the best cloak available for you. At the time. At the time. So interesting you say that because I just had an interview. Those were your with, words, Kino. With, that's so interesting you say that because I had an interview with Ras Mohammed, this uh, Indonesian reggae artist. And I told him, and Lynn will remember, I cut my dreads a year after Baby I Love Your Way came out. And, it, you know, it was a response to just a little, just too much pressure and me not being able to, to handle the notoriety and, and just, just the, 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 the spot that I was in. Um... And so my easiest way to be invisible was to cut all my dreads off, mm. which, of course, pretty much meant that I was going to lose my my uh, record uh, deal at that point. Uh, but what I, what I told Ross Mohammed was, what a lot of people don't realize was that one of the only things that was holding me together at that point was Islam and me being able to learn how to pray like a Muslim. And what was so interesting was that I found Islam more comfortable, I guess you could say, than even Rastafarianism, this 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 cultural movement that had meant so much to me and had given me so much, but it was like 
when I had trouble with Rastafarianism and it started to really kind of face some of my convictions, some of my spiritual convictions and started to really realize that, whoa, this whole thing about spirituality and God is a lot heavier than I was, that I thought it was when I was just a few years younger. And now I'm starting to realize I got to be honest about who I am and I got to be honest about what I really truly believe, right? And Islam was like the one thing that I could grasp because it felt more American to me based upon my my being inspired by Malcolm X and being inspired by you know the Black Panthers and it seemed more American to me right and like you say it was the closest mm -hmm. thing that I could grab at the time it was like mm -hmm. and and praying to Allah and begging for mercy was like it just seemed like the only thing that worked for me at the time that kept me from pretty much fucking abandoning the music business and saying goodbye to it forever. You didn't need an archangel. Yo. Prophet Muhammad, Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Um, you know, it just seemed like there was a structure there that I could hold on to. You know, there was a social movement that made sense to me that was that I saw in my neighborhood, right? I, I saw the, you know, the, 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 the black American Muslims selling their bean pies. They were on the corner every weekend. So it was like, I know this. These are my people. These are Americans just like me. Mm. And they might be black. They, they might be Muslim. They might be um, uh, different from me on a superficial level. But as far as being American, we're both grow up in the same fucking shithole. And you take that route, I took this route, but you know what? You and I, we can fucking mm -hmm. sit and drink a 40 together in the alley and we could fucking forget that I'm Rasta, man, and we could forget that you're a Muslim. We'll fucking sit down and we'll have a beautiful conversation. It'll be love and it'll be locked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot there, I think. Islam as a philosophy has played a specific role as a menace to the West, as an omnipotent kind of menace, as an oppositional to the West for a long, I mean, it's never not been that, right? right? I mean, that's exactly what the war on terror is now. It's that this, what Islam represents as a threat. Even in its philosophy, and it suggests that if, you know, in Islam suggests that if there is a paradise, if there is a heaven, the very first person that shall walk into heaven will be the slave or the former slave, right? And so there's this kind of humility of saying that, you know, you know, what is suffering and also what does the willingness to get free from slavery actually mean in terms of our righteousness? Um, but Lynn, I, 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 I can't help but to ask you, what was it like witnessing that journey that Kino spoke about in terms of what it meant in the music industry? I mean, you know, Kino's saying here, you know, I'm I'm losing my role in the in the music industry, but you are also part of that team in terms of the music industry at the time. But what did it look like, you know, from your angle? Um, well, it was different for us as band members because legally, contractually, Kino was the one that was actually signed to the record label, and the band was signed to Kino, so it didn't affect us the same way you know kino bore the brunt of that and the stresses and so forth because he had the obligation so he was our archangel <laughs> between the band and the record label you know so um i didn't cut, really cut off his wings yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> So I knew, you know, about the transition when he went from um, Rastafarianism, you know, to Islam. And I think before that, Kino, you know, because weren't you raised Roman Catholic? Yeah. Weren't you into Catholicism prior to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me on the outside looking in, it was just another part of his personal progression. I didn't really associate it with the industry. And I didn't um, know that there was any problems with the label as far as him changing his appearance, because you know, the, us as band members, we 
just weren't on that side of it. That was him. He bore the brunt of all of that. And you stuck with him. Yeah. I mean, as a friend, as a friend, I mean, you, you, you are being in conversation even to this day on any of these important matters just kind of is a testimony to the kind of love of friendship and the support, the things I was speaking about originally when we started today. Like, yeah. You know, our well, love you know, for one another is based upon who holds me down, who's going to be there for me when I fall. Right? Yeah. That's, that's black love. That's brown love. That's essentially the way that we know how to love is through, is through tragedy. It's mm -hmm. through trauma. It's through disaster. And that's part of the way that our world is built for us. Yeah. Well, you know, he's easy to love, so. <laughs> I can hang with him. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. I, uh, yeah, well, you know, Lynn, Lynn was always the only other, I guess, political junkie in the band. <laughs> <laughs> so she was or maybe the only one that could understand uh whatever whatever sense i was trying to make it at the time but I, I i just know lynn has always been somebody that i relied upon um heavily and, and, um and now you got paul you got paul in the mix to lean on huh? and you know i mean it, it, in, in the same token when paul and i met it was it was just like it was best friends, man, from the, you know, from the, from the get go. I mean, we just had so much fun and so much obvious love together. You know what I mean? And, and he, I've, I've dragged him along on this whole thing. And he, he was all, he's always been there, um, you know, in, in, in spirit and just kind of looking at me and just kind of turning his head going, all right, so why are you doing this? <laughs> 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 why? Why are we here? <laughs> I mean, I think it, it kind of refers it refers to like where we learn. And Adriana used the term organic intellectuals last week. You know, where we learn our ethics from. And I became natural and immediate friends with Paul and and you know Kino because we kind of came we come from the same worlds in a way. And it's it's like a natural relation. It's as if we've known each other our whole life. Yeah. And I remember times, you know, rolling along with the Big Mountain family and there's all kinds of studios and shit and tours that we're doing and stuff. And I didn't want to speak to half the people I had to come across, you know, tagging yeah. along with Kino. And I would <laughs> I would cling to Paul. I would just cling to him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Paul's, Paul's always been my, he's always been my big brother because I knew I could talk the way I talk and I could be the way I, I wanted to be and Paul's gonna understand. And that's natural, that's organic. I've, nev I've never met Adriana in person, but she's my sister and I love her dearly because of the ways we understand our industry. Like mm -hmm. she, reached, she reaches out to me and we talk and there's certain ways that I say things about our industry to her and I know she's going to have my back. I know she's not going to judge me. I know she's not going to try to correct me, right? Because we come from similar worlds. We understand the struggle. We understand the streets. We understand this from another angle. Mm -hmm. Lynn as well. I, you know, I'm loving Lynn in the same way. Just, you know, feeling like you're the big sister and that, you know, comes from the big mountain tree and, there's something natural and organic to that. And that's really what I'm speaking about in terms of building relationships based upon that shit. Well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you. <laughs> but no, yeah, I mean, that that's- comes Class struggle that comes from a lot of things. Yeah. It was like, I was watching um, television the other day. and um, I think her name is Gabrielle Duvier. Um, she was saying that when she married her ex-husband, she's black and she was married to a white man, um, that when they would go out in public, she would speak to black people. And he asked her, he's like, so do you just know all these black people? And she's like, no, when black people see each other, we speak, you know, because <laughs> that's, that's not something that goes on in the white community, you know? <laughs> So that is something, you know, like here, I live in uh, Rancho Penasquitos. There aren't that many black people here. And I used to live in La Jolla when I was going to school at UCSD. 
when I moved to La Jolla, you know, there were no black people at UCSD. And if you saw somebody two blocks away, you waved and they waved back. <laughs> because you would literally go for weeks at a time without seeing another black person. You know, <laughs> for real. I went to UCS, UCSD as well, and I tell yeah. you time that one of the reasons now I, why I work in Black Studies is because I just felt like I had to represent that perspective in a place where nobody was speaking about <laughs> African American history. There were no <laughs> Black people, right? And so yeah, yeah. Be right. Like you see people from way across the way, you're like, yo, <laughs> <they're> at least <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> so you know. Bad. And we just have that in the community because, you know, when you see someone that looks like you, there's the assumption that there's a certain understanding because you look alike, so you have experienced some of the same things in this country. And you just immediately, hey, how you doing? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, speaking to- in, and in the same token, it's not as easy to do that with a Latino, right? You know, oh, okay. Uh, like African Americans, like- black people tend to. I can feel. I feel very safe about approaching a black person and getting a response that I expect. Latinos, I I just uh, don't feel as comfortable term. doing that. It's such a huge term, and it encompasses so many things. To whereas, you know, blackness as we understand it, you know, derives from, as well, derives from slavery. But, you know, what Lynn is speaking about, and Adriana, you can probably speak m- m- more eloquently on this as an anthropologist, but what Lynn is speaking about is what anthropologists refer to as fictive kinship, which is the sense that, you know, when you're running away or fleeing the plantation and you're out on your own in the wilderness and you see another black person, that black person becomes your family. Yeah, yes. immediately. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. That, and that's why the term brother and sister are so important within black vernacular, black political culture. When you speak, you know, you're my brother. I call, you know, we, you refer to people, yo, brother, yo, sister. But that comes from the process of fleeing the plantation and trying to begin anew, as James Baldwin would say, to, ha- to begin again. Yeah. And to do that, you have to imagine people that aren't your blood kin as your kin. Right? Yeah. So the I- category Latino doesn't really speak to that kind no, of no it does not at all no. please adriana i was just going to bring in the the notion of uh, how the notion of um fictive kinship uh works also in the queer community mm-hmm. uh because if you look at how like trans youth have survived or how um uh lesbians gay men um gender non-conforming people have survived um you know political and legal persecution, as well as social violence and discrimination and prejudice and and fear, you know, it also has to do with that sense of fictive kinship and and people have constructed, you know, in the queer community, you always have like a gay brother. So I sometimes say like, oh yeah, my brother lives in New Jersey. And when people be like, oh, I didn't know you had a brother. I was like, oh, that's my gay brother. (laughs) So it's like, I got my family and then I got my gay family. Like gay is kind of like, you know, I'm showing my age. Right, like I'm showing my age by saying gay, but but it's just it, it just it's an alternative structure of social support for people that you know, like John was talking about, are are sharing some of your own experiences of of suffering, of difficulty, of struggle, of joy. Also, you know, not just it's not all suffering either. You know, and yeah. there's also a lot of joy that that mm-hmm. brings you together. Mm-hmm. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, mm. But it's joy based upon a condition. Yes. Of trauma. That's right. Yeah, and struggle. And, and struggle, struggle together. That's what gangs are. Yeah. That's yeah. what youth gangs are. Right. You know, when you when you when the Western traditional family fails you either because its values are flawed, as you're speaking of in the queer trans experience, right? The traditional family is not accepting of that, you have to flee and create a new family. You know, in, in, in terms of thinking about the genealogy of black and brown youth gangs. The tradition, the traditional family's failure, but also society has structurally failed you that makes family life impossible. Like, you know, there's poverty, there's capitalism, joblessness, drug addiction, alcohol, you know, families fall apart, imprisonment. 
So youth are on the street and they go looking for other families. And this, Adriana, is where the mythologies come into play. All of a sudden they create another mythology to say, yo, you're my family, you're my right. folk, right? right? Right. And well, then who are we? We're, we're we're almighty Latin kings and queens. Yeah, that's we're we Sha- we're Shaolin monks and that's what we are. Yeah, I was like, word, okay. So, like, what do we look like? I don't know. We got to come up with a color. We got to come up with a placa. We got to come up. That's the creation of a new family. I'm not yeah. saying that the things that gangs do are completely justifiable, but the impetus comes from just how weak Western culture is and how destructive capitalism is towards the very idea of being able to sustain a household and a family, mm-hmm. especially if you're a youth of color. Wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful. Paul? I'm tapped out. I get it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting kind of hungry, guys. <laughs> I need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Uh, well, hey, this has been wonderful, man. Uh, you guys, thanks again. I, I hope everybody's having as good a time as I am. I, I have so much respect for all of you, and I really appreciate your time. And I, I, I think these conversations are going to be real useful to somebody out there. And I mean, that's what we're trying to do, right? We're just we're trying to make a spark. We're trying to fill some holes. Like you say, we're trying to create a conversation where some people will just say, wow, you know what? That conversation feels natural to me. And why is it that the conversation I've been involved in in my life feels so unnatural, you know? So thank you so much. Lynn, Paul, Adriana, John, I love you guys. Today is a good day. You guys are about to meet Omar. Uh, We're going to give him a computer. And we're going to give a young man named Brandon a computer. Uh, This all started about two months ago when I met Omar. He said he didn't have a laptop for his upcoming school year. And it was going to be online. So I, I started a GoFundMe campaign. And so far, we've bought four computers, and we're going to give two away today. Check it out. Pues me da mucho gusto, en parte de um, Laptops for Students, uh, me da mucho gusto presentar este primer laptop a Omar Preciado Franco. Felicidades, Mucha, amigo. Muchas gracias a todos los que donaron. Sin ustedes no hubiera sido posible la entrega de esta computadora. Muchas gracias a Kino. Este, que sin él no se hubiera podido hacer eso tampoco. Y pues nada más que decir que, que pues gracias a esta computadora voy a poder seguir estudiando. Voy a, se me va a facilitar. Este, se me va a facil, facilitar este, estudiar. Va a ser un poco más fácil por lo de la contingencia con estas clases online. Muchas gracias. Nice. All right, well, we get a little tour of the neighborhood. We're gonna go uh, give a computer to a young man, a young student who uh, just recently um, had to deal with a bout of cancer. And uh, so we're really happy. We're really happy that he recovered and now we're going to give him something that I know is going to help him. Yo en lo personal entiendo porque pues a mí también me pasa que la se me hace difícil, se me dificulta al cuando no tenía laptop. Se me dificulta mucho porque tener que estar bajando, tener que estar haciendo muchos movimientos y entiendo por lo que tú estás pasando. Y pues qué más que Las personas que donaron te regalen una computadora. Gracias. Bravo. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Yes, we're doing good. Mm, muchas gracias por por la donación. ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué vas a hacer primero con tu computadora? Pues estudiar. Qué bueno. 
If you would like to donate to Laptops for Students and help us get some laptops to some deserving students in Ensenada, Mexico, so that they can complete their studies, go to the GoFundMe website and search Laptops for Students or go to the website on your screen now.